I was once at a dinner, uh, a small dinner, it was about tw- tw- 12 of us maybe, with Jordan Peterson. Uh, and I asked him what Western civilization is. And Jordan, in, as is his style, went off on a 20-minute thing. And I was like, I have no fucking idea where you're God going, Jordan. Him. Right? But what he said was very interesting. He said that he talked about how in chimp groups, the alpha male is quite often one of the smallest males. In other words, it's not a Jocko Wilnick. Mm. It's uh, me or, I mean, you're bigger than me, but, you know, it's one of us. And the reason for that is that the alpha male strategy, the pub brawler strategy in groups does not work very well for very long. You are only on top as long as you are physically the strongest male in that group. Uh, and, And when two or more smaller chimps can get together and kill you, they will. The difference with chimp groups is that the reason the smaller males are often the alpha male is that they're very good at building coalitions. And so to me, masculinity isn't about having big muscles or having a big head or wide fists or whatever. Uh, if we think about our conversation earlier about power, like I remember talking to Ben Shapiro about this and he was like, yeah, there's this guy on the internet who's like, yeah, I could, I could take off, got big muscles. And he was like, yeah, I could pay people to shoot you. That's the coalition thing, right? Power isn't projected through your fist in the modern world. It's projected through the power that you have over other people as a leader. So to me, uh, being hyper-masculine is not about having big muscles or having a big head. Um, It's about your ability to project power and authority. What kind of leader are you? Uh, And, you know, you mentioned other stuff like your level of aggression and all these all these other things. So I think defining masculinity as simply a physical thing is is very narrow. If you had to put people on a spectrum Mm -hmm. of masculine, Mm -hmm. who pegs out the meter? Is it Jocko Willink or is it Ben Shapiro? That's probably terrible because Jocko can build coalitions. Is it... um, What's his name? The the fighter, the boxer. He has a show called The Gypsy King. Otherwise, I would not. Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury or Ben Shapiro. Who maxes out the masculinity meter? <sighs> hmm, that's interesting. I, I think I suspect on that level of analysis, everybody would say Tyson Fury. Yes, I would. You would. However, the, the, the question for me is um, the definition is what predetermines the outcome, mm-hmm. right? Um, I, that's so important. Yeah. Holy shit. I hope people pull that out. Yeah. Well, how you define masculinity automatically defines who you think is masculine. Yeah. Right. And the question for me is what, which of those options would I like to be? I could go to the gym and become really big Mm -hmm. and strong. I could do, and I did it for a while. Didn't, wasn't particularly my thing. I didn't enjoy it. I like being in shape. I don't like having, you know, going to the gym and lifting lots of weights. I get it. Didn't work for me. And the level of power that that gives you over the power in in a healthy sense, influence over the world, being able to manifest the things that you want, etc., is minuscule compared to the power that you have by building groups of people who follow you into whatever battle or project or whatever it is you want to do. Um, And then there's the family aspect. How do you treat the women and children in your life? To me, healthy masculinity is a lot about that, actually. So when I see some guy with his shirt off uh, and big muscles talking about how he, you know, he's got 10 hoes or whatever, I, I don't I don't really see that as healthy masculinity. Agreed. Some people might do. And I'm sure the Genghis Khan model, which is basically that, some people would say, well, that's, you know, biologically, that is hyper masculinity because like half the world or whatever is descended from him. Mm. That would have been a great example. Genghis Khan, yeah. not gigantic, no. but is he hyper-masculine? Yeah, I yeah. would say so. To me, like, in fact, he pegs the fucking meter. Right. Kill them all, no problem. Just, we're taking over, we run this bitch now. Yeah, and actually, if you look historically, a lot of the leaders who really made a huge impact on human society, they've all been very small. Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin wasn't a big guy. Putin. Do you These, think that plays into it? Of course. I could see very easily how. Of course it does. It's like, oh, you think I'm not powerful because I'm smaller than you? I will show you. I want to go back, speaking of that, yes. to alpha versus beta. Mm. So I think we have a delusional sense of what an alpha male is. Mm. 
I saw a documentary. I used to think an alpha male would be Tyson Fury. Not, I don't know him. He could be the smartest guy on planet Earth. Uh, but the sort of once removed thought of him as, as a fighter, a big, physically intimidating fighter. Um, I saw a documentary about wolves and I was shocked, shocked, I say, when I saw that the alpha male was small. Mm. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? And what I realized in that moment was the alpha is the decision maker. The alpha is the coalition builder. Mm -hmm. The alpha is the one that can think. Because again, in, in the marketplace of we are wolves and if we don't take down that caribou, we fucking die. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you go, yeah, bro, that guy, I don't know how, but he knows where to go and he knows where to be and he gives me the look at just the right moment. And when I follow him, I eat. And when I don't, I don't. And so what ends up happening oftentimes is the alpha male is small, but fucking sharp. And the beta male, which in our society has gotten a terrible fucking rap, mm. is the enforcer. And it was watching that documentary was so unreal. So you've got a pack of whatever, six wolves, mm. alpha kind of small, beta the biggest. Mm -hmm. And when they all went for the kill, the um, beta male came and told everyone to fuck off, mm. growled, mm. backed everybody down so the alpha could eat the liver. Mm -hmm. And I was like, holy shit, he's not even doing it for himself. Mm. He's, well, I mean, he is. He's protecting the alpha to make sure that the right person to make the decisions and all of that, that can keep the group together, whatever, whatever, is well taken care of, well fed, and has what he needs. So that really got me thinking. So. Yes, while I agree with you that the person who's going to have the outsized impact isn't necessarily going to be what I will call, quote unquote, the most masculine, mm. because again, all of us are 120 sided dice rolled. Mm -hmm. And so like, hey, maybe I'm as smart as Genghis Khan was, but I'm not vicious like that. Mm -hmm. Like I just, dude, like when I think about people getting stabbed or I'm just like, oh God, mm. like clearly I'm not gonna be the guy that goes and takes over the planet. Uh, that shit just, I'm way too squeamish for that. Mm. So when I think about the thinking of something on a simplistic scale is probably the flaw in my thinking and that it's really a far more dimensional three dimensions. If we want to go all the way to four, it's like, you've got a tesseract of traits that makes for masculine, <clears throat> feminine, whatever, which I think leads to also some of the debate because it really is such a complex topic. If somebody can give you a hyper simplified version, I say I'm Stacy, therefore I'm Stacy. It's it has a lot of gravitational pull because it simplifies a very complicated idea. And sticking with the alpha conversation, who who was the alpha? Michael Jordan or Scottie Pippen? Scottie Pippen's a lot taller, a lot bigger. Yeah. Who was alpha? Obviously. Kobe or Shaq? Uh -huh, that's a good one. Right. What's really interesting in that one is they were both alpha and that was the problem. That's why they collided. They couldn't, neither could defer to the other. Yes. If Shaq had been the enforcer, they probably would have won 20 championships. Right, exactly. Um, but I think ultimately Kobe was the alpha in that situation and Shaq eventually, mm. you know, uh, same with, uh, the, the, there are lots of situations like that. Look, at, at that level, they're all alphas but someone's got to be the alpha in that particular group. Yeah, that's interesting. And how fast that happens. When you've been the best ball player in your every team, your middle school team, your high school team, your college team, and then you get to the NBA and you're like, oh shit, I'm like seventh or eighth in the pecking order. Yeah. It becomes a real question about, can you become a, a, role, player. a role player? Yeah, that's exactly right. right. And he, I forget who it was in um, I think it was 11 rings by Phil Jackson and Phil. I know you listen to this show. God, I wish I had doubt it very much. I so want to get him on. Mm -hmm. uh, He'd be an incredible. Oh guest my God. You. So we've gone out for years and years and years. And he's always like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just not during the basketball season or his team. He probably doesn't even fucking know. But, um, anyway, in the book, 11 rings, I'm almost certain it was in that, that I forget what player he had to approach, but he was like, you're a role player. And the guy actually could do it. He could mm. set his ego aside and be like, even though it might have been Stephen Carr. Like, Steve Kerr, maybe? Steve Kerr, Steve Kerr. Yeah, that you. makes sense. Uh, that even though he had to, like, he had always been the best of the best of the best of the best, he was like, yeah, no, that actually makes sense. Yeah. Well, cool, I'll do it. Yeah. 
so I think uh, when we think about these How things, how the fuck do you know an NBA reference? You're Russian. What's I'm going on? I'm massively right? into NBA. A huge fan of the really? NBA. Yeah, Michael Jordan was my hero. It's one of the reasons the way we talk about race does my head in because I was like. I was a kid. I didn't care who was black or white. I loved Michael Jordan mm. and I saw myself in him. It didn't matter to me what his skin color was. You know what I mean? That's why divisiveness about race bothers me so much. Uh, but yeah, the NBA, uh, was, you know, I love basketball. It's a great sport. Great sport. And uh, a lot of my heroes kind of watching, mm. growing up, watching those those guys. Uh, and sport is beautiful because it's it's ritualized combat. And so it teaches you a lot about human dynamics and tribe dynamics and, you know, different tribes fighting each other and how you marshal that and who has to run the whole thing. I mean, if you think about, you, you know, sticking with the alpha conversation, it's not quite true anymore. But historically speaking, the point guard, the smallest player, would usually be the one running the whole show. Mm. That's the role of the point guard. Um, so I think um, our conversation... And also, you know, who's going to be sending Jocko Wilnick into battle? Someone's going to be telling him where to go and who to kill. Unless I can get him to run for president. <laughs> well, go for it. Yeah, yeah. I remember last cycle, that was one of the options um, that, do you know Brett Weinstein, right? Yeah. So he put that, I, uh, I forget what it was called, Freedom Party 2020. Or no. I forget what it was called. Something, something, 2020. Uh, and yeah, I really, it was Jocko and somebody else. And I was like, yeah, I'd vote for that. <clears throat> I would vote for that. Yeah. But alas. Okay, so um, do you understand my position on trans? Because if you don't, the audience doesn't. And no, I understand your position. I just don't think that's what anyone's interested in. But I understand your position and agree with it and always have done. Got it. So I'm taking a reasonable position, but you know that the world is has already had that conversation and they completely reject it. That is my impression. I, I hope to be wrong. Right. Yeah. Okay, um, I don't know that belaboring that point will get us anywhere, but I will tie it real fast back to the whole reason that I want people to pay attention to the malleability of people is that we began this conversation with once you get obsessed with that, you have to understand what you're getting obsessed with is the breakdown of structure. Once you break down structure, mm. now you have a problem. In fact, the one last thing I will say on this, so in film school, they teach you that one immutable thing is true, and that is the constraints make for creativity. Mm -hmm. And that when you try to have no constraints whatsoever, things don't actually get better. They somehow end up getting worse. Mm -hmm. And I think that holds true for the vast majority of humanity, for, for all aspects of humanity. That doesn't mean, and this is why I find that the circle of, this is why I think that the circle of history, obviously not an exact circle, but comes very close to that because humans long to get free of those constraints and in times of stability, they can push back on that and they they find that, whoa, many of these things were freedoms that now that I have, my life is better and this is amazing. And so then you think more free is gonna be better and you push back on everything, 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 everything. And then it breaks and then you're, the strong man comes in and like reapplies structure and constraints and you can't do that. And, then you get out from under it as things stabilize and freedoms, yay, and then freedoms break and then no freedoms and loop-de-loop -loop we go. Weak men create hard times. Hard yeah. times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good yeah. times create weak men. And, yep. and round and round we go. On and on. But it's a spiral. We move up and technology is a big part of that too. Mm. I mean, uh, for all our fears about AI, and I really know very little about it, I think that maybe it could be the end of us all. It could also be the saving grace that that comes in at exactly the right time and just solves some of this, some of these problems. I have a feeling it's going to play out like this. It right the moment you're living through right now, everybody. It's a tool, and if you're not using it, you are not long for this world. You will get passed by by the people that do use it. Can't stress that enough. I hope everybody on my team is listening. You know who you are. Some of you have adopted it, and some of you are being real fucking slow. And you're being slow because you think I'm going to fire you for uh, in replace you with AI, but I am not. I, but I am going to expect you to be way more efficient now that you have AI. Uh, so we are in the moment of tools. Use it as a tool. It will make your life so much better. Oh my God, the ways we've been able to deploy it are mind bending, Same. saved us so much money. It's absolutely astonishing, <laughs> upped our quality. Uh, we put these out, these comedy monologues on our channel. Uh, that Francis and I do, and also monologues that I, my Substack pieces that I record and put out as videos. And the guy who edits them, he basically does the illustrations entirely through AI generated stuff that is amazing for creating things that illustrate the points that we're making comedically and otherwise. It's insane, man, what you can do with it. It's insane. And it's getting better 
by the second, not even by the day <laughs> or by the week. It's it's unreal. Mm. The next phase is going to be uh, <laughs> that it will look like it's ushering in the utopia because the tools will become so powerful. It will be unbelievable. But humans... For us, technology is the promise of a better future, and we always want a better future. And as long as anyone ever has a sick child or has to face their own mortality, they will keep pushing technology forward. And since that is true, I know that we will create artificial super intelligence. And once you have artificial super intelligence, that isn't, so I love running the math on this. So a moron is, but a literal moron is defined as somebody with like a 78 IQ, 78 mm -hmm. to 81, something like that. It's right in there. Uh, that's that's the literal definition of a moron. Einstein was 162. So you're something like 2.3 X smarter or mm -hmm. 1.6, whatever the fucking math is. And very uh, Einstein would know. Yeah, yeah, he would know. And I wouldn't, <laughs> and that shows you. Uh, I'm a little too close to a moron. So uh, it's less than 3x, mm. for mm -hmm. sure. So artificial super intelligence is not going to be three times smarter than you, or five times, or 30 times, or 100 times, or 3,000 times, or 3 million times. It's going to be a billion <clears throat> times smarter than the other person. So if the difference between a moron and the atomic age and the person who gave us GPS and atomic weapons and atomic energy and all that uh, is whatever, less than three times better, what does the world look like when something is a billion times smarter than us? We, we are so inconsequential to them that if we can't align AI, we simply will accidentally cease to exist. Mm. What does it even matter, man? Like, honestly, if there was a, a type of bacteria that made the Everglades like 0.00001% more productive, do we care? Does it matter? No. And so that will be humans in the grand um, sense of the cosmos to a super intelligence. So now I have a whole thesis around, I don't think, my, my whole argument hinges on one base assumption. My base assumption is that desire is not a necessary part of intelligence. If it is, and that that super intelligence will want one thing over another thing, and it will move with rapidity to get that better thing, mm. then the odds of us being aligned are effectively zero. That makes the base assumption that desire is an innate part of intelligence. If it is, then my argument doesn't work. But if it's not, then what we need to do is make sure that AI, as it developed towards super intelligence, does not care uh, life or death for itself, completely irrelevant. Um, get my goal, not get my goal, completely irrelevant. And so by default, I will move towards my goal, but if somebody tells me to stop, I will stop. Or if a certain set of criteria is met, I will stop. The problem is in the tool phase, you are going to have a human who cares very deeply about something. And he, that person will almost certainly imbue AI with a desire to accomplish his ends. <clears throat> and they will not realize the second and third order consequences of that is that you become irrelevant extraordinarily fast to something that you've now imbued with a desire to achieve its goals. So yeah, I think the, oh, wow, this is weird. I can say this and just be distressingly blase about it. I think that it is inevitable that AI will happen and it is inevitable that our only hope is to uh, flee AI to the point where it doesn't care about us and is not trying to eradicate us. Sorry, not even trying to, it won't try to eradicate us. We will be the anthill to the super intelligence building a highway. Uh, as Elon Musk says, no hard feelings. So just, uh, this is what I have to put here. Mm. Um, but if we can get away from it, that's probably our only hope. Yeah. That doesn't sound that optimistic. Super dark. The weird thing is I'm like really optimistic as a default, but I think that my optimism is just me leaning into uh, the, the wonderful human ability to say, I know I'm gonna die, but not today even though I might die in like nine seconds. So it's probably something like that, but I don't see another way. Do you? I'm like just you, counting the seconds. You have, right? <laughs> you have a son. For yes. you, this shit is real as fuck. So what do you think? Like, are you on, like burn AI to the ground, stop building it. Is that your- Not right? possible. Not so po how do you, you think about it? You can't, you can't Luddite this shit. It's not gonna happen. Cheers to that. So the only thing you can try to do, I mean, all of the sci-fi of my youth was wrestling with this question. The three laws of robotics, Asimov, all, all about this. And, and Did you read Dune? Uh, yes. Well, I don't remember it well. Dune but opens it, with, it is against the law to build a human-like intelligence. Yes. So you can't stop it. And that means we have to work with it. 
one way or another. How that happens, I have no idea. I'm not nearly smart enough. It's not my area of expertise. I don't understand it well. Um, but we have never been able to suppress any technology, at least to the, as far as I know. Um, and so far, we have always learned to live with the technology that we've created. Now, eventually, we're going to invent one that we can't. Until then, there's no point thinking about it. I can't control that. I can't change that. All I can do is raise my son to be resilient for the world that's coming. I like that. Resilience is the punchline. It's one of a very small handful of things that people should optimize their life for if they're going to achieve fulfillment, which is really what I'm trying to help people do. Mm. <laughs> um, give me resilience. What What is it? So we define power, define resilience. Most people spend their entire life trying to get other people to not fuck with them. And the answer is not to get other people not to fuck with you, it's to become unfuckable with that's what you're trying to get to where you are who you are and uh, the world sort of flaps around you and you are going to your goal uh, undeterred by whatever else happens because you know where you're going uh, and resilience is the ability to deal with failure to pick yourself back up when things go wrong uh, to I mean I learned a lot about it from you actually and from our conversations which it's about seeking feedback and reevaluating your starting positions. Uh, Ayn Rand uh, has a very interesting, you know, Ayn Rand is a great uh, is a great author to read in your late teens. It's a kind of late teen philosophy that she has. Um, because it's overly simplistic? It's very idealistic, mm. extraordinarily idealistic. Uh, but one of the things she says that I really have taken on is whenever you think you're facing a contradiction, check your premises, one of them is wrong. And very often when you experience some kind of setback, the one premise that people don't check is, well, I did everything right, didn't I? Usually that is the premise that's incorrect. So resilience is being able to deal with what life throws at you and keep going. That's resilience. It's, it's the Rocky speech. What do you mean it's the Rocky speech? Remember when he's talking to his son? No. And he says life... Is Rocky 3? I can't remember which Rocky it is, but he's, he's talking to his son in the street. And he says, life, life will beat you down no matter how hard you are. But the question is, can you keep going? That's resilience. That's so good. I love that shit. I love that. I, boys and girls, get hard. Get tough. I think resilience, I want to separate resilience and anti-fragility. But mm. for a second, I just want to talk about resilience and Rocky IV, which I do remember. In Rocky Four, is that the one with Ivan Drago? Yes. Oh, yes. The sexiest of them all <clears throat> was so incredible. Oh, that's right, because you're the bad Russian. Mm. Uh, but it was. I will concede he was hyper masculine. He was hyper masculine. <laughs> Dolph Lundgren, <laughs> especially in that movie. Woo. Mm. Uh, but there was that whole idea of I will break you, mm. and he just was literally beating the shit out of Rocky. And the cool thing about Rocky is he's always the underdog. He always had to fight back and he could just take a beating and he just kept going. And I was, so I teach something called Impact Theory University. Mm. And I had a student today asking me and I started laughing and he was saying, I I'm trying so hard and I just feel like I'm constantly hitting a wall. And he was like having this just like emotional turmoil and I'm laughing. And I thought about like, doing the laugh emoji in the Zoom call. And I thought, he's not going to understand what I mean by that. And the reason that I was laughing is, yeah, that's what comes for all of us. My days feel exactly the same. I feel like I'm battering my head into a wall. I am failing at most of the things that I try. I'm running test after test after test after test. And I don't know if you feel a sense of ownership over Churchill because you're adopted British. But dude, <laughs> Churchill, I know he's controversial. I love him. And one of my favorite quotes from him is success is the ability to go from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. And it's like, that is so true. Mm. Like you're going to get kicked in the face over and over and over, like all the fucking time. It's unrelenting. And yet somehow you have to keep going. That is so anti-fragility. I try to get everybody to build an anti-fragile personality. Mm -hmm. An anti-fragile personality is one where the more people attack you, the stronger you get. So if you're anti-fragile, the more punches you take, the stronger you get. The only way to do that is to um, 
to emotionally reward yourself for being able to take punches. Mm. And once you're like, oh, it's my willingness to take the punch, to stare nakedly at my inadequacies, to pick myself back up, to wipe the blood off, to spit out my broken teeth, versus to never get hit or like, um, <laughs> oh God, what's his name? Everybody, the boxer, uh, money. Floyd, Floyd, Floyd Mayweather. Mayweather. Thank you. You're really coming to my rescue with all mm -hmm. these fighting uh, and sports people. Thank you. Um, so people really began to hate him because his whole thing was, you just can't beat me. You and, can't hit me. Yeah. So his whole thing about like, <laughs> he wasn't like Tyson. Everybody loved that fucking Tyson. Animalistic just broke you apart. And I think people like his redemption arc. Uh, but Floyd... The like, I can't be hit. There's nothing cool in that. I can't relate to that. I take punch after punch after punch. So I want the guy that can take a punch and like he's battered and bloody, but somehow manages to come back. And when you can get hit and become more resilient with each punch, then you've got the right set of ideas that you're building your personality around. Well, I don't know if you caught on our channel, we put, <coughs> um, we put an episode out uh, about the future of trigonometry. And we talked about the year that we've had to date. We nearly went bankrupt in January. Whoa. Um, Francis and I had a lot of stuff to work out personally and with each other. Mm. It was a really rough time. And we made it through. And now we're infinitely stronger, you know. And now the next phases of failure are coming. The stakes are getting higher. There's more money involved. There's more things that we're doing. We're building. We're expanding. Um, that's life. That's life. Things are going to go wrong all the time. Terrible things happen to everybody. And the character is how you know when you react when they, when they happen. Mm. <clears throat> define character. Is it a set of values? Well, I just did define character. Character is, is how you react. Yeah. Well, so what's the right way to react then? <clears throat> well, it's hard to say because it really depends on what's happening, right? But the right, it sounds to me in terms of what you and I are talking about is the right way to react is to be stronger after whatever it is that happens. So I'll add a few more things to that. Mm -hmm. So integrity over everything. Yes. I'll define integrity. Agreed. If you said you're going to do it, do it. Agreed. Um, I mean, look, I guess you could say that Hitler had high integrity because, man, he fucking wrote in Mein Kampf exactly what he's going to do. And he fucking did it. And it was horrible, as horrible as something gets. Um, but I'll stick by that definition. You say Terrible people it. can have integrity. Osama bin Laden had incredible integrity. Yeah. So, oh, like he did watch porn, which is, I, I mean, I haven't really? read. Yeah, I, mean, I haven't. They found a stash of porn at his house. Seriously? When they, yeah, yeah. That is hilarious. Now, I haven't read my Quran cover to cover. But I'm guessing watching porn isn't in You're there. You're pretty sure that's yeah. that wasn't yeah. in there. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, so, yeah, you say you're going to do it, do it. Mm. Uh, but then I'll add have honorable goals so that we can get rid of the Hitler problems. So you should be doing things that uplift not only <laughs> you, but those the world at large. It's probably otherwise I'm going to get caught in another Hitler trap because uh, people around him, I'm sure for a while, are having a great time. You must uphold your people. Yeah. Oh, that gets problematic quick, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, very quick. Uh, hopefully people know what I mean, that you're trying to um, lead people towards human flourishing. Okay, so mm. uh, what else would I add to that? So willingness to stare nakedly or, or at your inadequacies steering by the truth. In fact, we're now getting into, so we had the problematic beliefs, uh, and then I have a new set of rules that I'm gonna propose. Mm -hmm. So just to wrap up the problematic beliefs, um, tearing it down versus incremental improvement, mm -hmm. which I think uh, people think that something will be rebuilt from the ashes, That that is foolish and dangerous. Uh, and there is a reason that societies have structure and that we all say we're standing on the shoulders of giants, so be careful. Um, it's a it's a harder one to talk about though I think because this country was built of revolution tearing it down what do you mean what do I, what do you mean what do I mean this country is the product of a revolution revolution I thought you said evolution no revolution so I was like huh no ooh okay so <laughs> I would posit yeah. that it was built on revolution but it was not built on tearing everything down and in fact there's mm. a reason that um Churchill rightly said that America, even though America had displaced, I mean, he didn't, he, he was born in the 1800s. So he was like, 
not that far removed from England was really the shit. And he certainly was at the height of the British Empire, was there as it declined. And he was like, America is sort of the right, rightful heir mm. of this set of ideas mm -hmm. that should not be owned by any one country. Mm. And I always thought that was, for all of the horrible things, um, I think that that's the right way to think about it. And I think that America really pushed back at a time of like, hey, you say these are your ideals, mm -hmm. but you're not living up to them. Mm -hmm. And so not only are we gonna try to up, live up to them, we're gonna try to improve upon them. And so it does feel to me like America is standing on the shoulders of the, the British approach sure. to self-governance, the individual um, uh, case law, uh, we're going to get to that yeah, yeah. my understanding. No, of the it very the fast, French but... and Russian revolutions were a lot more revolutionary. I uh, agree. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. So, uh, so don't tear everything down. Yeah, you, one ought to be very careful about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, we've ta touched on masculinity, so I won't beat it to death. But masculinity view, masculinity and aggression viewed as toxic, because. If we have any entrepreneurs out there, I would just like to say, I was asked by an online coach if they needed to build their own app in order to launch their business. I told them what I'm telling you now, focus on what you're great at and leave the tech to online tool builders like Kajabi. With their all-in-one platform, it's easy to turn your skills, passions, and experiences into online courses, membership sites, podcasts, communities, coaching, and more. And you get to keep 100% of your revenue because everything is owned and controlled by you. Kajabi also has robust analytics, easy payment options, email marketing tools, and customizable website templates all built in. And right now, Kajabi is offering a free 30-day trial to start your business if you go to kajabi.com slash impact theory. That's K-A- J A B I dot com slash impact theory. Kajabi dot com slash impact theory and join the creators and entrepreneurs who have made over six billion dollars. Uh, as in the immortal words of my high school cheer squad, B aggressive b e <laughs> aggressive mm -hmm. you need to be aggressive that doesn't mean uh to drop integrity it doesn't mean to be unethical it means to be aggressive you need to be aggressive uh fiscal irresponsibility is probably uh, my audience will love to hear me talk about that because that's economy but probably oh, a different interview uh, i mean sure but that that is something i've been talking you, about i've been talking more. i've not seen your interviews on the economy what you got for me well i don't think there's going to be anything new but I've been saying I love old. since 2008, like we've ent emptied the medicine cupboard and we are not ready for the next one. In fact, this is how the cycle of spending and borrowing has always worked historically. You create a surplus in times of peace, war comes, you spend that surplus, you ac accumulate that, then you pay it off and you build up a surplus in times of peace again. Uh, we don't have wars as much, although we do. But, you know, pandemic, financial crisis, these things always come along. And you have, I mean, it's kind of basic economics, basic household situation. And, and then somebody comes along and goes, oh, we've got this cool new thing called modern monetary theory, which is basically just code for we can print as much money as we want. Well, that runs out fast. And eventually reality, you know, we always talk, you and I have always talked about the clash with reality. Mm. And by the way, people don't realize this, but it's one of the main complaints that the the Chinese and the Russians and the others have about Western um, behavior. It's not just territorial or in any other way. They're like, you're printing money, which affects us because you're buying our goods with your increasingly devalued money. And we are the ones that suffer. This is not a sustainable situation. And you talked about my son. We are borrowing. We are borrowing money to spend on things we can't afford and indebting our grandchildren who are not yet born. It is immoral, it is financially irresponsible, and it's going to lead to disaster if we don't stop it. Yeah, this is where uh, the set of ideas that we pass along culturally becomes so critically important. But also, since I think I, I don't think there is a way to stop it, mm. and I certainly invite anybody to show me that I'm wrong, but the, the approach that I took to preparing for this episode was recognizing that, look, empires are going to collapse. Look, the collapse of the U.S., is, it is inevitable. Now, whether it happens in the next five years, 50 years, 500 years, that I don't know. Historically, it's probably in the 50 to 100-year range. It'll happen slowly enough that, for the most part, like 
if you're alive, you're, you're able to take advantage of it, but you have to understand the game. And so one of the things, cause again, I, I just, I think at the individual level, one of the things you have to understand is you have to re up your context. So if you were trying to play a game of chess, but you were never looking at the board, sure. Like if you're so good that you don't even need to know what your opponent is doing, cause you just like are able to guess. But I mean, realistically, even the grand chess masters look at the board, they understand where we are. They understand what your opponent is doing. And so people need to go, okay, where are we? What is the cycle? Where are we in the cycle? What does that mean? And how do I inoculate myself against mm -hmm. it? And the problem is that getting the timing right is virtually impossible. And having the right idea with the wrong timing is the same as having the wrong idea. And so that was, I transitioned into really thinking about the economy and world events and all that stuff, because I saw what happened in 2020 and I was like, people are going to get obliterated. Now I didn't understand printing of money yet. And I didn't understand how we were socializing losses. But now once you understand they're printing money, then you have to have a strategy for that. So you have to be watching the board, understanding how the context is changing, updating your thinking. So I had the really surreal experience of uh, Ray Dalio comes on the show, he writes his books and he keeps saying all that matters is how people are with each other. And that one of the things anybody needs to do, if you want to have a strategy to navigate all weather, uh, war, peace, um, your country is the dominant power, your country is the declining power, whatever. Like if you want to navigate all of this well, you have to understand um, what, what it boils down to is how people are with each other. I didn't understand what he meant by that. And he kept saying how people are with each other. Wah. And I bump into him backstage in Dubai. And Everything is, and this wasn't that long ago. So everything's very unstable and I'm starting to get unnerved and I, a lot of people moving to Dubai and I'm just like, huh. I meet him backstage and I'm like, oh, wow, Ray, like seeing you in Dubai, like, uh, you know, oh, I come to the Middle East a lot. And I'm like, say more. <laughs> Why do you come to the Middle East a lot? And he was just like, you know, there's so much going on here and things are really popping off and they've done an extraordinary job here and in, um, in Malaysia and he spent a lot of time in China. And so he's just laying out like, he did not say, I wanna be very clear. He didn't say like, oh, I need to make sure that I have places that I can go if America ends up not being the place to be, but you can start connecting the dots with this whole idea of there's a ton of division in America. Uh, there's instability with America as probably a declining power, China as a rising power, instability elsewhere in the world. And it's like, you need to be able to, um, go to different places if that's where you need to bounce. And that was one of those, it's part of the game I would say I'm weakest at. I'm very rooted in California, mm -hmm. um, which makes me extraordinarily nervous in terms of a place that has embraced ideas that sound good, but are not delivering quality results as somebody that's been here for 30 years. I'm just like, bro, forget me. I've thrived. I've done nothing mm. but thrive. I look around me mm. and I'm like, yo, the policies are not working unless you're like me and you've made just ridiculously outsized wins. And so, yeah, that doesn't seem like a winning strategy. So that's one of the ones that I'm very slow to react to. I'll be very honest. I don't ever want to have to leave LA. I don't ever want to have to leave America. Um, but I do want people to be realistic about what the chessboard says. And the chessboard says what the chessboard says. And you need to play based on what you see. Let me ask you why you think this isn't going to get fixed. Okay, so... Because <laughs> I have a theory on that, but I want to hear yours. All right, so I think that humans are the way humans are. Mm -hmm. The brain works in a certain way, and these cycles have run in cycles forever because we only have, there's only so many, like even if we're a hundred sided die, a hundred dice with 20 sides each, and we're all a roll, that's still only so many personalities and we react to each other uh, in very specific ways. And we probably break into only so many clusters of personality types. I'll peg it, random guess, but that there's, let's say 30 groupings of what people are like. And so it's like, okay, well, those 30 people are only gonna react in so many different ways. Then there's only so many possible uh, economy static, economy rising, economy declining, um, uh, war, stability, um, lost war, one war, like there's only so many situations. And so this really does become pretty predictable. Ray Dalio again has broken it down into six phases. It's tied to the debt cycle or the business cycle. And as you start walking through it, it's like, yeah, they're not identical for sure but it's pretty predictable. So he did this whole breakdown of the last uh, 500 years. He looked at really closely. And then he looked at a much higher level, I think like the last 2000 years. So he was like, yeah, it just repeats over and over and over. And 
when I look at, it's the same thing that I feel with AI. I just look at what humans are like. And when the group starts overtaking individual think, it, it only ends in one way and that's violence. And there's, I think out of the last eight times that we've been declining power, rising power, uh, debt, like all the things that are true right now, six of the eight times it's ended in war. And so it doesn't always end in war, but most of the time. But what is the mechanism by which people refuse to address that problem? Why is it? What are the incentive structures? The, Do you remember? The, yeah, the incentive structure is I want my life to be prosperous right now. I'm going to elect anyone that promises me that things will be prosperous. The way that they do that is debt and printing money. You can only take on so much debt and print so much money before something happens. It's typically a pandemic or war. And that breaks the back. Like you said, the medicine cabinet's empty and we got sick again. So uh, we have no money remaining because we've been spending in foreign wars and uh, printing our way out of 2008, printing our way out of COVID. And so now it's like, okay, if, so I'm gonna make a hypothesis. I, I'm, I'm not the thinker to listen to on this. I just want people to understand how I approach novel problems. So um, I'm looking at this moment and I say, okay, what, what I understand about things is um, when you print money too much, you just increase inflation. That when you have, we added a trillion dollars of debt in a month. In a month, dude, we only have $33 trillion in debt. So like if you're adding, that in a month, like th this is bad. And this is times of like, everything's okay, but we're sending billions of dollars in aid to foreign wars. We just had another war pop off with another ally. Like, what are we gonna do? I have no idea what we're gonna do, but I start looking at that and I'm like, if I hate America and I'm just looking at the chessboard and I'm playing to win and I'm, let's say China is the most logical example. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, I'm playing to win. I see a weakness in here. And P.S., most of the war is always going to fought, be fought surreptitiously. So I'm going to start doing my belt, road and belt, or belt and suspenders, whatever the fuck it's called. Belt and, and road. Belt and road. Thank you. So I'm going around. Belt I'm investing. and suspenders is a whole yeah, different thing, different, my different thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm going around and I'm investing in all these different countries to make sure that I have allies that that want to um, you know, work with me, uh, that are basically invested in um, my policies, my influence in the region. And look, of course, China has its own problems. And I'm, as an American, I'm counting on that, hobbling them enough that it sort of everything balances out <clears> and <throat> that there isn't some runaway train where everything's great for China and we're too weak. But that's, that's the power dynamic. So I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, hmm, if China takes a stance on Israel-Palestine, I'm going to be very curious to see what the posture is. And again, if I can believe what I saw in X today, their stance is that um, Israel is, has gone too far and this is no longer defense. That can be read. Again, I'm not the person to go listen to Ian Bremmer. He's going to be a far, far wiser voice on all this than I am, uh, or Ray Dalio for that matter. But I'm going to guess that it's playing out something like this. That's a shot across the bow for America to say, hey, America, not the thing to back. We think they need to be to back off. If you keep saying, yeah, 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 they should be defending themselves, then okay, one, we think that you're overextending. We're letting you know how we think about this. We're watching to see how far that goes, how tied up in that you goes, what other areas in the region pop off. If obviously Iran, I think, made a public statement where they're like, ah, oh, like we don't want to see this go anywhere, which would be awesome. But like this, this is the chessboard. So China wants to see how tangled does America get into that? They're obviously not for Israel going any harder. Are they going to get involved? Are they not? Who knows? We'll see. But if that's them setting the stage for them to move something forward with Taiwan, that those are the pieces moving around the chessboard that makes me go, okay, uh, what do I do if this really does escalate into a world war, a true global, global conflict? What are the different players looking for and how do I position myself to um, not get mauled by all of this and to ideally actually be able to take advantage of the opportunities? Now, I can't tell you, I. I would not trust myself enough to be the purveyor of the news of what to do in that. I'm the person I trust to say, this is how you need to think through the novel problem. Mm -hmm. You need to be resilient. You need to understand that opportunities are gonna open up. You need to have enough dry powder that you're able to take advantage of that, which means that you have to be fiscally responsible. And so anybody that's telling you to just spend, 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 and we can print money forever, 
That is not a person you want to listen to. That's somebody that's going to get overextended and out over their skis. So I try to be really honest with myself and others about the part you can listen to me on and the part where you need to go find somebody smarter. So getting this sort of geopolitical landscape, don't know. I'm, I'm listening to other people, but understanding how to have the mental and financial fortitude to have an all weather strategy. Yeah. That. I've, I've got to take on that. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the incentives to me are very, very simple. People don't want to don't want to reduce their quality of life now, even if it means impoverishing their grandchildren, which to me is one of the most horrific and irresponsible things we can do as a society. But that is exactly what we've been doing and, and will do and, and will continue I, I to do. I don't see where to stop. I don't either, because I don't know if you have this conversation here in the US, but in the UK, it's like what you want to reduce public spending. That's killing people. That that's the moronic level at which we have the conversation. It doesn't go any further than that. Yeah. Do you think that's a problem? I think that that is the current language around the forever thing, which is what you just said. I don't want to reduce the quality of my life. And 15 years is a long time to punt. And maybe it's not 15, maybe it's 50. Mm -hmm. And so since I don't know the timing and can't get it right, yeah, I'll punt. So print money, uh, take out debt, uh, I heard back in the 80s, we had trillions of dollars of debt. It's not a problem. It's all good. And the bad news is, and this falls into the same category of thing as the malleability thing, where it's like, you can really get away with bad thinking for a long fucking time. Yeah. And so it's like, is it bad thinking? Or is the world going to get a clown on me in 10 years because I was wrong? And I mean, I can assure you, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm so confident that I'm right about be resilient understand human nature, find your way to ground truth, be a prediction engine, but we'll see. Only the fullness of time will tell. So what do we do with that? What, how do you, do you have a strategy for unwinding this? It's gonna sound very naive after everything you've said, but it's it's tell the truth. Things. Tell the truth, change the culture, you know, in terms of Look at the way that this format has changed the way we communicate. The media empires of the future are going to be built in the next 10 years, and it's going to look like something like this. Podcasters coming together under one umbrella or various media outlets being formed from new media. This is the future, what we're doing here. Did that, you know that The Daily Wire made $200 million last year? I didn't know that, but it doesn't surprise me. Bro. Those guys are kicking ass. Bro. I was like, God damn. Yeah, yeah. So I'm Trigger Media is going to be... Th the next $200 million company? <laughs> we'll see about that. It's harder to do in the UK. So it might be a 50 million pound company. Or we might to move start, to the US. Or we might move to I the US over way. time. You're right, exactly. Uh, but that's what I want to do. Uh, and part of the reason I want to do that, the main reason I want to do that isn't to make $200 million. It's to change the way we have these conversations. The triangle of evil is... Uh, Mao, Stalin, Hitler. Mm -hmm. And I think that they, I've read a lot about them and they feel to me reflective of something that's just real in the human psyche. Um, and I have taken away from reading about them. So Oddly enough, Hitler was like sort of the, the slow boy in all of this, did not kill nearly as many people as Stalin and Mao, like, which growing up, I never heard about. I had no idea that those were uh, dark figures mm -hmm. in the world, which is already startling. But reading about them, uh, getting back to this idea of their... So, in fact, we haven't talked about this, but we sort of danced around it. The way I see the world is it is... a. Uh, um, a scale. So you have right and left just to keep it easy. Mm -hmm. But there's pathology on both sides. Mm -hmm. So if you go too far in either direction, you're going to have a problem. It doesn't matter. So Mao and Stalin are what the left look like when they become pathological. And Hitler is what the right looks like when it becomes pathological. Um, in, even in, in and of itself, I, that's disputable, but we can get into Hit that. me with it. Well, people don't like to hear this argument, but there's a reason that Hitler's party was called the National Socialists. Interesting. And what does the right then look like if it goes pathological? Well, this is the debate. I mean, 
so not only Nazism, but also fascism. I mean, the term fascism comes from the word fascia, which is a bundle in Rome that was woven. It's a, it's a collectivist mindset. Mm. Both the fascist and, and the national socialists on a large number of things were uh, left wing in, in the way that we conceive of being left wing now, economically particularly. Um, we have an interview on our channel with uh, one of my favorite guests ever. He's a brilliant guy called Stephen Hicks, a uh, Canadian professor uh, of, he's a philosopher and historian of philosophy. And, and if you kind of want to delve into that, I'd recommend people go and check mm. that out because I, I won't do it justice here. Uh, however, I, we can also conceptualize it rather than going as a scale, as a circle, which is, or, or like a, a horseshoe or something where the two extremes end up coming quite close mm. together because they end up operating in similar ways. Um, so it's a, just a side point really for, for our discussion. No, it's actually very interesting. So uh, reading about them, seeing that there's this horseshoe yeah. shaped where the the they're trying to control everything because and I'll even give them I'll I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and I will say they're not evil they really believed that they had the right answer now it's tough to look real close and not feel like they weren't just fucking evil mm. but that's too easy it's it's an easy way to dismiss them let's say for a second that they really believed in their heart that they were going to do good things for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And, but just real quick, I just have to kill a few of you mm -hmm. in order to get everybody in line because I'm trying to distribute things fairly or I'm trying to, in the Make case a of- better world. Yeah, in the case of Nazi Germany, like, hey, we got a bum rap, you know, after World War One, like we got to rise out of this somehow. And, uh, but I'm going to have to kill a few of you. And I am going to have to make sure that you don't say anything bad against me. And so to distribute everything evenly, uh, we're going to have to kill the kulaks. And, um, but at the end of this, everything's going to be okay. Mm. So what is it about human nature that allows people to think that to usher in the utopia, it's okay to break a few eggs to make the omelet? I don't know is the honest answer. Uh, I think we talked a little bit about collectivism before, and I think that's a big part of the answer to your question. Uh, collectivism is an ideology that uh, justifies the sacrifice of some for the benefit of the greater good. So the pathology requires the abandonment of the individual's sac sacredness. It, it, certainly in the cases that you are talking about, that was absolutely the case. Uh, mm -hmm. These are not people who believed in the rights of the individual. Uh, these are people who believed that for the greater good, some people must be sacrificed. Um, and who knows? I mean, one of the difficult parts of this conversation is, can you run a country like Russia on a Western liberal mindset? This is a big debate among geopoliticians. Because the people just won't take to it. It's not so much about the people. It's it's a pretty fucking hard country to survive in. It's cold. It's remote. It's disparate. It's poorly developed. Uh, can you really uh, make that country exist uh, without authoritarianism? It's, mm. it's, a, it's a legitimate question, actually. Why would it need authoritarianism? I thought you were going to say you would need collectivism. Well, it's both. So you can't have one without the other. Really. So you need a totalitarian leader to have a collectivist state. Is potentially a way of looking at this That's issue. I'm, I'm not committing to that statement. But if you look at uh, the history of Russia, I mean, Russia's never had democracy, mm -hmm. ever. There's mm. never been a single proper democratic transition of power in Russia, ever. Hmm. Ever. Um, it, it's, it's not the case, uh, you know, the, there are different ways of conceiving of it. A lot of geopolit geopolitical thinkers talk about, uh, the civil, different types of civilizations and British and American civil civilizations. Like, um, this is actually something I have a, a couple of pieces on my Substack about this, uh, breaking down the philosophy of a guy called Alexander Dugan, who's called, uh, they call him Putin's brain. Mm. Now how influential he is in the Kremlin, we don't know exactly, but 
I break down some of the, the basic arguments, and the argument is that uh, countries like Britain and America, they're civilizations of the sea. They're trading nations, they're commercial nations, they use the power of their navy, historically speaking, like the British Empire and today the United States, to influence and, and, and interact with other countries. Whereas, and this goes back historically, Carthage was a civilization of the sea. This was a trading nation and they stood in opposition to the Roman Empire, which is a civilization of the land, mm -hmm. to the Chinese and the Russian empires today, which are civilizations of the land. And one of the arguments is that civilizations of the land are necessarily collectivist mm. and necessarily authoritarian because the way that they have to operate in the world is very, very different to the way that trading nations operate because the values of liberalism, for example, are much more suited to a naval-based trading nation uh, than it is to a, a land-based nation like a Russia or a China. So to some extent, you know, Am I claiming that if it's kind of like that argument about can you bomb democracy into Afghanistan? Well, it turns out you can't, right? And that's because they have their own culture and their own values that don't really then that it's not having voting booths is not enough for democracy, right? Mm. It requires certain other cultural assumptions that don't exist in other parts of the world. Um, so yeah, collectivism seems to be a particular thing that goes hand in hand with authoritarianism and it makes sense because if you have a society in which um, the majority is going to kill a minority or tell them what to do or restrict their rights and somehow that will require force mm. inevitably yeah that's the part that always feels like it's missing from the dialogue of people that want to uh you know redistribute wealth or whatever is at some point when you start taking things from one person to give to somebody else, you're going to have to do that by force. Like it won't, it won't just happen naturally. And so you really stopped me in my tracks when you said that uh, a collectivist nation requires an authoritarian leader. I had never thought about that before. Um, that's really interesting because I had always thought about it as just communism requires an authoritarian leader but I didn't step it back to the collectivist society that ends up giving birth to communism. Also, just by its nature, that's where it's headed. Mm. Uh, that's really interesting. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't I don't actually know if it's true. I'm throwing it out there as, mm. as an idea for us to discuss. It I rings think distressingly it's true. true. Yeah. I just don't like the way it makes me feel. Uh -huh. So that, okay, so the reason that I call this a triangle of evil is mm. because reading about it was really eye-opening. So I grew up in Tacoma, Washington, not particularly educated on this kind of stuff, then went straight into business as a way to have enough resources to tell my stories. And so maybe when a lot of other people were waking up to what the world is like, I was not. Um, and so I discovered this when I started reading about history and when you read about history, you start to see the patterns that people are talking about. And you're like, whoa, like this stuff really does repeat. Like this becomes really predictable, which is why I it feels like talking about culture is important mm -hmm. because whatever happens to the culture is really going to have profound impacts on the individual, my bias again, uh, and how they either can thrive or not thrive. And so reading about for instance, how Mao took over China um, and what the human tragedy is when you really believe that it's okay to kill as many people as you need to in order to have the power to make the world go the way that you want it to go. And I can't help but keep defaulting back to um, if you know what your goal is, and you know the experiment that you're going to run and you can look at the outcome of this mm. it's like hey this is predictable that if if you try to do communism like you cuz everyone keeps going well communism hasn't really been tried or socialism uh, hasn't really been tried it's like but you can run it even as a thought experiment so even if i grant you okay these were all imperfect the thought experiment should lead you to realize it can't be done perfectly like it's not possible because you're asking every single person to willingly give things up on an equal basis and 
when you interface with the world in any capacity, you very quickly realize it, it's just impossible to get everybody to think the same. Mm. And so my read on this is that evolution guaranteed that people don't think the same, that it wants that dynamic tension that we were talking about before. Mm. What do you, like as somebody that grew up in the USSR, what do you say to people that are like, oh, it's never really been tried and we just need to get it right? You know, in some ways, I almost don't think there's any point in saying anything because I don't think they're coming from the same place that you come from when you're talking about these things. You come at it from the point of view of what is my goal? How am I going to get there? Mm. Uh, I don't think the people who advocate for, you know, fairly extreme forms of socialism or communism uh, or social democracy, as they call it, but often it's really a disguise for, for, for their views. Uh, I don't think they're coming at it from the point of view of a goal. I think they're coming at it from a point of view of dissatisfaction with the status quo. Mm. Uh, and people who start revolutions are operating almost always on that basis. How often are you checking your credit score, afraid of identity theft or account breaches? We all use the internet every single day for important things like personal banking and remote work. So why not protect yourself with our sponsor, Aura? Aura is an all-in-one cybersecurity service that keeps you safe online. Aura identifies data brokers exposing your info and submits opt-out requests on your behalf. Aura also monitors your credit, tracks your passwords for data breaches, and secures your online activity with with VPN and anti-malware protection. You can try Aura for free for two weeks by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code. It's not about, you know, you know, I was driving past a shop and I saw a better table. I'll go and buy that table. It's like this table is so bad, let's throw it out and then we'll find something, mm. right? Um, I think that tends to be how people think about it. And, you know, the thing I always say to people in the West, you, you talk about the inevitability of it all. Um, uh, as you know, I talk about this in the book. My grandmother, she's not my biological grandmother, but she, she was my grandfather's second wife, and I always called her my grandmother. She was born in a gulag. She was there because her parents, who weren't married or didn't know each other at the time, had been sent there, both losing their other spouses in the process. Oof. And they met there, and she was born in, in this camp. And what happened once you were released from the camps was you were not allowed to live within a very long distance of the major cities in the USSR. Mm -hmm. You essentially became a, like a, a third-class citizen. And what happened was most of the former prisoners of these camps ended up settling in areas and small towns nearby where they lived together with the local small minority of the local native population, various sort of tribes that had been living there for, for centuries, and the former guards from the very same camps that these Whoa. prisoners had been in. In 1953, when Joseph Stalin died, um, my, grand, my grandmother and her family, they were living in a tiny flat, tiny apartment uh, across the landing there was another apartment, which was a family where the man was one of the guards in one of the camps. Jesus. Living across like this. And uh, my grandmother tells a story how that guy's mother, w if the kids misbehaved, she would say to them, you know, w when your parents get sent back to the camp, Jesus. you're going to get kicked out and we're going to get your apartment as well. Wow. Now, 1953, Joseph Stalin dies. And... My grandmother told me that there was a spate of suicides among these former guards. Whoa. Because what they were doing was finally revealed for what it was. These people truly believed. They truly believed that they, they were beating these people and torturing these people and killing these people for the greater good because that's what they were told. Mm. And so what I say to people in the West always is do not be a useful idiot. Do not violate your own moral standards and your own moral rules for the sake of the greater good. There is no greater good than your own moral standards. There is no greater good than that. Do you know, and in fact you do because you've read the book, but most people have no idea how the USSR got a nuclear bomb. It was given to them by 
co- Soviet, Soviet sympathizers in the West. And that is why Joseph Stalin, a man who killed millions of his own people, ended up having a nuclear weapon and was able, therefore, to threaten and challenge the West. And that's how you end up with a Cold War. Mm. Because people in the West, some of them, were so enamored with their own vision of utopia that they would give the most destructive weapon in the history of the world to one of the most evil men in the 20th century because they believed in this collectivist vision and they were useful idiots. Do not be a useful idiot. Do not violate your own moral code for anyone, for anything. That's what I say to people in the West. How do you come up with a moral code? Well, you're going all Jordan Peterson on me because <laughs> when he had me on his podcast, we had a three-hour conversation about God. I listened to it, yeah. Yeah, and it, it was difficult because <laughs> the flippant and obvious answer is it's what I learned from my parents. It's what I learned from the books I read. It's from I learned from the society in which I lived, from the movies I watched, and mm. what I the residual, um, the the residual thing that I got out of that. Um, Jordan Peterson will probably tell you it's religion. You know, other people will tell you something else. I don't have that answer. I wish I did. Do you think we live in a time where you have to cobble one together? I've had to cobble one together, yeah. Yeah. Have you? Yes. Right. So that's kind of wor- <laughs> worrying in, in some I ways. I think it's part of why we're at where we're at. That's that's what I think that's what we're talking about exactly. But I also think a moral code it's not always true because a moral code will sometimes require you to jump in front of a tank. But generally speaking, a moral code is a good long-term strategy Mm. because it is a way of relating to other people and to reality that is more effective than others. This is one of the things that I find so funny when people say to me, oh, Constantine, you're so brave for speaking out about these. I actually believe that. You believe that? Yeah. It's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on. Okay, well, what I say to those people, are you fucking mental? <laughs> what are you talking about? What are you talking about? How is it brave? My ancestors starved to death in the gulags. What, you think me expressing my opinion in public is brave? Yeah. Why? That's insanity. There's nothing brave about it. It's my duty to say what I think if I think that something is wrong, isn't it? Yes. So why is that brave? Uh, just because something is right doesn't mean that it's not, doesn't demand courage. Okay, how does it demand courage? Ooh, that's interesting. This doesn't feel like you could possibly be asking me that question. I love it. We are, we are equally thinking the other person is absolutely out of their minds. <laughs> okay, so uh, here's how I look at your life. You are, you are whippet smart, man, and you are really articulate, and you could make a real living even in the soviet union if you just like turned a part of your brain off that was like i'm either never going to talk about these things Mm -hmm. or i'm only going to talk about them when i'm at home and i will use the system to my advantage i will work my way up which you'd be very easily be able to do uh because you can outthink people so i have a feeling if you had just a little evil in you you could get people to think things were their ideas that were clearly yours Uh, you would manipulate the shit out of them. You would rise to a position of power. And so you could do all of that. And now it would require you to set aside your moral compass or not have one Mm. or adopt one out of convenience, which I I unfortunately think humans are all too capable of doing. So the fact that you don't do any of that, the fact that you um, are in a Western country in a moment where people really get a certain religious emotional um righteousness Mm. out of tearing down wrong think Mm. and the wrong people and it makes them feel like they have done something good and it's a a sugar version of moral virtue but it's still like something it gives them a rush Mm. and so now look you're not dumb so you've made you've made a a good living out of doing that and i think your channel is only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger but um because in I'll say I'll say in a single sentence why to me it's you seem brave. Uh you're a contrarian. You don't mind the conflict. You actually posted a hilarious photo of you, maybe it was a video, I can't remember, on Twitter. It was you with a machine gun, and you said, uh, 
uh it's like ready to open twitter yeah exactly exactly and i was like that's fucking hilarious and then yeah i'm not gonna do that because i hate that and my audience this may not seem as weird to you because this is the only time we sat down across from each other my audience is gonna find this episode very weird Oh, are they? I've never done an episode like this ever. Have you not? Never. Oh, wow. So, wait, you should have told me. I would have gone easy on them. No, this is great. I love it. Like, I, I will. I would have lit a candle. You no, know, I appreciate s- that. Did a little stroking. You know, <laughs> it's very kind. No, 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 no need. <laughs> but it's um. So anyway, I when I see people that are just completely unafraid to roll up to Twitter with the machine gun in hand. I'm like, all right, you you say what you believe in. You're standing for something. I think. But it's what should I be afraid of? This is what I don't understand. What what is it that I'm supposed to be afraid of? A bunch of people I don't know and don't respect on a social media platform where they don't even show your their face or name saying things about me. No, you should fear what's happening to Jordan Peterson. He said he's in the middle of ten lawsuits. As somebody that's been in the middle of lawsuits, let me tell you what a toll they take on mm-hmm. you. And he, maybe I'm too stupid and not brave. Maybe that's what's going on. I don't think you're stupid, but you might be naive to something. Yeah. That is entirely possible. Mm. And as you crack, it'll be interesting to see what happens to you when you crack a million subs on YouTube. It starts to get different real fast. Yeah. And what's happening with Jordan, where he's with the whole Bill C16, mm-hmm. which I can think of no hotter, like that's the nuclear core. Mm-hmm. And he came to prominence by latching on to the nuclear core. And he has said in his very Jordan Peterson way that um, I, if you arrest me, I will, uh, if you give me a fine, I will refuse to pay it. If you put me in jail, I will go on a hunger strike. And I actually think he means it. I think he's so fucking stubborn Mm. that he actually will. And in the Gulag Archipelago, there's a great section from Solzhenitsyn where he says, it's really interesting. People come in, you get tortured, everybody breaks. Actually, that's not true. Not everybody breaks. And the people that are so ideologically like convicted, they, they will let you kill them and they're all women. And I was like, that is fucking hilarious. Going back to what you were saying about men and women being different. And I just thought, that's my wife. Mm. My, and that's Jordan Peterson, which he has said, I have a more feminine temperament. Mm. Like he just will get something in his head. And it apparently, no matter the amount of pain that rains down on that man, mm. he just keeps going. And uh, that doesn't look fun to me. His life does not look fun to me. But I believe, you know, Jordan isn't perfect. He's a man. Clearly. And by the way, I think he's amazing. So do but I. Holy shit. Uh, does he sometimes say things? And I'm like, Jordan, are you trying to make your life suck? Like, that's a really dumb way to say that. But if we come back to the very beginning of our conversation, which is about meaning and fulfillment, I couldn't be fulfilled using my whatever. You're very kind about my intelligence and everything else, using that for things that I, that I fundamentally. I think are wrong, mm-hmm. right? So that so, reads as brave. P.S. Well, no, what that reads as is not having a choice. Doesn't read as brave to you. I get that. I hear you. But I don't have a choice. Uh, bravery is when you're like, well, I could do this. Or I could do that. I'll do this. I don't really feel like I have a choice. I feel like I, I you know, it's weird that I, I have a background that's quite unusual, that is perfectly fitted to the cultural moment of at the moment, which is, I can't, I was born in the Soviet Union, I speak Russian and English, I understand both cultures, I can articulate myself pretty well, I grew up in Britain, so I fit in that culture, I can see it as an outsider, and likewise in America, um, you know, I can make things funny if I need to, I can be serious if I need to, like, it's a, it's a skill set and, and a background that not many people have, so what choice do I have? Would you be a dissident in Russia? Yes. Yeah, see, fuck. Do you know... Uh, My whole family were dissidents in Russia. So, like, it's it's not it's not a new thing. <laughs> that is very interesting. Do That's you know- actually one of the things that... I wrote a piece on my Substack when my son was born. Um, uh, and I talked about a lot of this. You know, we come from generations of people who, who were killed for their beliefs. Mm. I'm not going to dishonor them. I, I'll say it again. Uh, from where I'm sitting, that's brave. 
I want to think that I would be as tough. I don't know if I'd be a dissident in Russia. That's just the honest answer. And it doesn't make me feel good about myself. Mm. But, and the story I will tell myself tonight is going to be that I would work in the underground. But I wouldn't be, I think her name is Nadia from Pussy Riot. Mm. No fucking way. And I, I have met her and had her to the house. And I was just like, what the fuck were you doing? Like, that was my impulse. Hmm. It was just like, uh, you know they kill people for doing that. So, yeah, I'm, I, I am terrified that I could ever become the useful idiot. I am terrified that I will get tested by life and come out a coward. Uh, so I do, I mean, the whole reason that I have changed the tenor of my show over the last three years is to not feel like a coward. Uh, but I don't know that I'd be a dissident in Russia. I don't know that I would. You know what? I think the truth is that nobody does. You don't know who you are until you're in that moment. I, I might turn out to be a little pussy if I, if, I, if I go back to Russia, which I don't for precisely the reasons that mm. we've discussed. Um, I don't think you do know that. I don't think anyone does. Um, but my point is, and, and this is it's, it's not a self-obsessed conversation, I'm just, I don't understand why people keep saying this to me. The, the things that I'm saying are reasonable things. Uh, I do my best to articulate them in a way that people can hear. Sometimes I fail, mm. of course. And sometimes, just like Jordan Peterson, I'm human, right? So I say things that piss people off and uh, I'm surrounded by people who give me advice on how to say them better, for which I'm grateful. Uh, and one of the things that really I find very positive, particularly after the Oxford speech that I did, I get very famous people from the left reaching out to me now and going, can we talk? How about this? Can we discuss this? Mm. Giving me advice too and going, look, if you want to, you know, we can see that in your speech you were trying to reach the other side. Well, if you do, here's a way that you might want to phrase this, right? I see that as reassurance. I see that as, as a sign of that I'm doing the right thing. Mm. But I don't really understand what, what this is that I'm supposed to fear. You know, okay, I, I don't know why Jordan is in 10 lawsuits, but do, do, do I think that I need to be? Probably not, you know? Um, I haven't made a massive living out of trigonometry. It's just something that pays the bills at the moment. It, it will get to a point where, you know, it's it's massive. I look forward to that moment. I see already in the last few months what happens as you grow. Mm. Uh, the words you say matter more. People take them more literally, more seriously, and you have to... But that's a, it's an exciting challenge, isn't it? And, you know, I remember it's a moment that stuck with me when I was a kid. Um, I went to a boarding school, uh, and so we rarely encountered the parents of the other kids. Well, one time I was watching a, a rugby game uh, that my friend was playing in, and his dad was on the sideline. And we were talking about a, a, pre, a game, uh, an international rugby game that had happened a few days ago. And somebody said to him, well, you know, there was this player, he took the final kick. Imagine that pressure. Mm. Wow, that's got to be hard. And this dad of my friend, he said, that's not, that's not how you think about it. The way you think about it is, imagine how many people would love to be in the position to have that sort of impact. Mm. And that always stayed with me. You know, what a privilege it is. You know, I've just spent however long, you know, before we sat down and people would think I'm sucking up to you, but we sat down, we were talking about uh, various stuff. And one of them was, uh, my business, trigonometry, you know, and I could see within seconds that you've got like one of the in most incredible mindsets about that stuff that I've ever encountered. And I get to sit here and speak with you for hours. Where's the bravery? Come on, man. Tens of thousands of your countrymen, many of whom are still alive, stormed the beaches of mm. Normandy. Come on. Come on, more people need to say what they think. And it's not that scary, and it's not that hard. And by the way, if more people did it, it would be a lot less scary for everybody. Mm. And that's why, you know, I, I came here from Bill Maher's show. Bill Maher is doing exactly what he should be. He's using his voice to say enough, enough of this craziness. And guess what? Nothing happens, especially if you're a multimillionaire Hollywood celebrity. Nothing happens. And guess what? His audience is now filled with people who were clapping points that I was making, right? That's what happens when people speak up. 
So let's, the reason I resist so much this label of brave is not some personal thing. I just think it, I'm not saying it's true in your case. I'm not saying it's true in other people's cases, but a lot of people want to push that bravery onto me so they don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. So they can say, well, I'm not as brave. I'm going to sit here and say nothing. Well, it doesn't take any courage, really. It just takes principles. The problematic ideas that I think cause the collapse of any civilization, any empire, uh, Rome included, and I, I literally watched a bunch of documentaries on the collapse of Rome uh, specifically for this, and th this is exactly what you see. So you've got um, people start to believe that prosperity is a fundamental law of nature that's just going to happen, and they take it for granted. Uh, they begin to believe that the group owes the individual versus the individual owing the group, and so the group begins to um, basically take away from the individual so they can distribute to the group. A little counterintuitive, but that's the um, inversion that happens. Uh, begin to believe that redistribution is the miracle instead of prosperity, being this hard fought thing that you cannot take for granted. Uh, they start to believe that everything is a social construct, that there's no ground truth, that we can push back against nature. It, it doesn't have any fundamental laws. Uh, diversity of values of the same team is inherently good. We actually didn't talk about that. Um, but to encapsulate it quickly so that we can get onto the, the good stuff. Um, again, to quote Thomas Sowell, <laughs> nothing has ever been taken as fact without uh, so little, little evidence as diversity being our greatest um, advantage. And he went on to say that diversity is not by default an advantage. Diversity is the thing that we have to overcome. I'll say that I think to keep that comment from becoming pathologized, it's really diversity of values mm -hmm. that are the problem. Ironically, you want a diversity of approach. You want different mindsets. So you want uh, visionaries and executors, which will always have friction between them. You want um, men and women in a marriage is a great example. You need the friction between them to raise a child well. Uh, <laughs> but diversity of values, I think, is problematic. So at Impact Theory, we have a set of values that I publish and I say, hey, here, here is the culture at Impact Theory. If you don't like this, um, this is not the place for you. Mm -hmm. And we will not hire somebody that does not share those values. So, but whether they're male, female, gay, straight, man, woman, li I, black, white, China, could not care less. Mm -hmm. uh, I care not at all for whether we end, like if, if this company ends up being all black women, I'm here for it. As long as we share values and we have all the different idea sets and they'll challenge each other and challenge power and all that stuff, word. Um, so we happen to have a diverse group visually, but we didn't hire for that. Mm -hmm. We hired entirely for, do we share values and will, will you buy into competing, um, based on meritocracy and ideas? Uh, don't tear it all down. Uh, sorry. They start to believe to tear it all down is better than incremental improvement. Masculinity and, and aggression is toxic, becomes all about uh, spending money, racking up debt, printing money. Okay, now the new set of rules. Um, I'll run through them quickly, and then you tell me which one you want to dive into. So I think people need to seek self-correcting structures. Mm -hmm. I'll call that the American experiment. So it's uh, ideas that force itself to spiral upward. Mm -hmm. um, you have to want dynamic tension between opposing forces. So left, right is mm -hmm. the, the easiest one. You have to want there to be a left and a right. Mm -hmm. You have to want that dynamic tension. I have evolutionary reasons why I think that's true. Um, I believe that everybody should have the North Star of human flourishing. Um, you have to steer by results. So if our North Star is human flourishing, that we're, we try something, but if it didn't work, we have to admit that it didn't work and try something else. You need to reward merit, even though it will yield inequality because some people are just smarter and better than others. I fucking wish that wasn't true because there are so many people that are smarter than me. Uh, freedom of speech, absolute cornerstone. You have to seek disconfirming evidence, which is part of why you need freedom of speech. Uh, you need to reinstitute rule of law. I actually heard a really interesting story from your partner, Francis Foster, uh, who said one of the things that was a hallmark of Venezuela was they started to not impose um, punishments because that was right where right wing authoritarianism. And so he, he was like, it became the Myrtle capital of the world wow. and a whole bunch of other horrific things. Uh, so you do need to reinstitute rule of law. So going back to this idea of we've pulled all these threads of the sweater and it's now falling apart, you need structure. And in the constraints is the creativity. 
Um, so I think that's important. And then overhauling education so that everyone is trained in useful ideas so that they can maximize whatever skills and talents they do have. So even though it will be unequal, there's no reason that the, the idea starting line, because our talents, unfortunately, will always be unequal, mm. uh, but that the idea starting line can't be equalized, especially with the fucking internet. Go to YouTube, the smartest people in the world, and I will not count myself among them, but the smartest people in the world are giving their best ideas away as fast as they can fucking talk on any subject you can possibly imagine, all for free. All you have to do is be able to access the internet. Uh, and P.S., if your country is clamping down on the internet, that's a red fucking flag. Mm. Agree with all of that. Any, it's all great. Any you want to add? No, that, I, I think that you nailed it exactly. All right, so nailed let's, it exactly. let's go into them. Which, which do you think are most important? I think they're all super important. It's like saying which of your legs is more important. I think you have to rank order. My right leg is more important than my left. Is it? Yes. Why do people... So you are fucking smart. Why is your initial reaction to not want to rank order things? I find, in fact, now I'm going to talk to you. You're a budding entrepreneur. Yeah. My friend, you will have to get fiercely good at rank ordering everything agreed who's who's better you or or francis uh at what of course it will be different at different things but you're going to need to know on everything that matters which one of us is better agreed. who are your best employees uh, again along different dimensions what tasks should you do first you you can't do two things at once i'm pretty good at that at this point I, I have so I now have a lot to improve you're going to rank order these fucking things okay or at least i'll give, give you two answers one will sound glib as i can't remember all of them okay fair number Would you one you like to look at them uh could do uh number two i do think sometimes it's like it's the new rules section yes um the but it's also like what is more important to bake a cake flour or a bowl well you kind of need flour a bold bad example. Uh, no, flour. I'm or... going to be a dick and just keep doing that. <laughs> of course, I understand your point. Your point you is need taken. Everything. But I, I, yes, I do though think that people create a certain okay. amount of paralysis. All right, for all right, all right. Fine. To stop you being a dick. There you go. Well, I, I fucking can't. Okay, steer by results. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's obviously super important. But can you steer by results if there's no rule of law? If there's fucking people running around stealing shit all around you? I mean, you can try. But without yeah. the rule of law. So I'll I'll give you the steer by results to me is the ground truth, Agreed. which you said is the thing that you're trying to do. I think you've already got it. Yeah. With the truth is ultimately the only thing that's going to take you where you want to go. Yeah. So I think there's stuff in here that follows from that. If you steer by results, you will necessarily reward merit, even though it creates inequality. Mm. Right. That that so you can cut that one out, actually. You just need to steer by results. Then that is a natural process. Okay, it's interesting. There's something happening between the two of us. There's our worldviews are colliding right now. Oh, hello. I, I don't know if it matters. And so I'll touch on it briefly and see if okay. it seems like it's going to go somewhere interesting. Um, I I run into this. I think that the, th the very thing that makes me a good entrepreneur mm -hmm. is that I am willing to speak in binaries and rank order everything. Okay. And I think people get lost in the, that everything is interconnected because that is true mm -hmm. and it will also fuck you up. Why? Because you'll get lost in the complexity and you won't boil things down to what do I do with the next 15 minutes of my life? Mm. And ultimately, this is the reason that the vast, 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 vast majority of companies never make it to a million dollars is the person um, doesn't understand the physics of progress. And what the physics of progress forces you to do is accept that you have imperfect knowledge, but you must act as if you have perfect knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then as you act with your imperfect knowledge, you, so I'll explain it this way. You have two jobs. Job number one is to intoxicate your team with certainty mm -hmm. because otherwise you can't galvanize a bunch of people, which you said the alpha male is the one that can create unity amongst the group. Okay, the only way to do that is to give them certainty. Agreed. Uh, if you can, oh my God, your Oxford speech. Mm -hmm. You said, let me tell you what Xi Jinping is doing. The only way he's gonna stay in power is if he gives people the one thing they want, which is prosperity. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, cool. We know that there are gonna be certain ideas that were, they're actually gonna move the needle, they're gonna move people forward and they're gonna be ideas that are not. So we're gonna be in this loop of, I'm gonna intoxicate people's certainty, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna give you prosperity, I'm gonna promise it, and cool. 
But if Xi Jinping is actually going to be successful, he has to go. Is this zero COVID policy working? Mm -hmm. People are starting to riot mm -hmm. a lot. I don't mm -hmm. like this. I'm going to adjust. So he has to have some mechanism by which he's checking himself. So I've told everybody, you know, hey, everybody, without question, as if it were divine statement, zero COVID. And then it's like, oh, shit, it's not leading to prosperity. I'm going to check that. I'm seeking disconfirming evidence. Okay, fuck, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. I'm going to adjust. And hey, everybody, as if I never said this other thing, zero COVID is stupid. And now we're going to unlock and we're going to open. So you have to intoxicate people with certainty and you have to constantly check yourself to see if that's actually true mm -hmm. and update your thinking. Mm -hmm. And so it is very difficult to do. But people that can't do it, and most people can't because they're so lost in, oh, but it's all interconnected and all of these things are important. Yes, motherfucker, I understand that. But you have to do a thing. And mm -hmm. P.S., you have to tell people what thing they should be doing. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't tell people, we're doing this, mm -hmm. and my best guess of how to get there is this, so go do that. Mm -hmm. And then, by the way, your employees are going to push back on you. Mm -hmm. They're going to fucking test you and they're going to see, are you the right alpha or should I be running this company? Mm -hmm. Because there is one immutable truth. If you're anything like me, and unfortunately I'm, I'm not Steve Jobs enough to just be like, look, asshole, this is fucking awesome. What you just said is dog shit. Go do what I said, which apparently is literally how he talked. Uh, I can't do that. So I'm not smart enough to have all the right answers. Mm -hmm. So I have to, I have to let people challenge me. But if I'm not the right person to lead, mm. now we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So I have to let them challenge me, but I have to squash rebellion. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this is what happens to people. They get so lost. Oh, maybe you really are right. That they are not like, no, we're not fucking doing that. Thank you. I heard your arguments. I steel man their arguments so I know they understood. And when they're right, I just go, you're right. Mm -hmm. Boom. We're instituting that immediately. Mm -hmm. But if it's, I think, the wrong thing, and now... They're high on their own supply because maybe their last three ideas I implemented right away. Mm -hmm. They're like, no, 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 Tom, you don't understand. I've got to be able to squash that rebellion. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I've got no problem doing any of that. Word. But yeah. this comes down to being able to say this fucking thing is the thing we well, need to do the, right the, now. The, 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 the slogan is that I say to all our team is the only reason we're all here is we care about the outcome. This isn't about you. It's Mission not driven. about me. It's not about France. It's not about anybody. It's about the outcome. Smart. If what you're doing is furthering that outcome, great. If what you're doing is not furthering the outcome, we don't want to hear. Yeah. Simple as that. Um, steer by results is basically that, right? So to me, that's number one. <clears throat> Seeking disconfirming evidence seems to me to be part of that too, right? Because that is what you have to do. How do you do that in your life? Steer, uh, seek disconfirming evidence. Mm -hmm. You know, probably not well enough because I wait for life to slap me in the face. And then I'm like, oh, shit. OK, that wasn't good. It's interesting. You have a persona that makes me nervous. I could never adopt your persona, which I get is a reflection of who you really are. But on Twitter, like you go hard on people. And I'm always like, mm, I'm too afraid I'm going to change my mind like two weeks from now when I get better evidence mm. that I'm way more gentle um, it depends what you're talking about, though. I don't think you're going to change your mind about the fact that meritocracy is superior to diversity artificially created. I have a high degree of confidence on that. Me too. Correct. And that's why I go hard at people who try to substitute one for the other. So you only go hard on the things that you're already like super high confidence. And then if I don't know about something, I don't say anything about it. Yeah. However... I, somebody was uh, trying to make me look bad this morning on Twitter by bringing up something I said at the very beginning of COVID and presenting it out of the historical context, mm. right? I said some things at the beginning of COVID that I don't agree, didn't agree with by the end of COVID. But what people forget is it was a completely different situation at the beginning to the one at the end, right? You know, the first lockdown I supported, I still would, I, if, it, if it were to happen again without prior knowledge of what happened this time, I'd be like, yeah. Let's let's see what happens here. Let's be careful. We don't know what this is. Um, but generally, I only try, I, I try very, very hard and increasingly harder and harder as my audience gets bigger to only talk about the things on which I have a high level of confidence. How do you update your thinking then? Let's say that you are supremely confident about mm -hmm. something. How do you maintain the stability? So we've been talking a lot about structures necessary. Mm -hmm. So you need a scaffolding of your thinking. These yeah. things are the, the, the things that I hold to be true. Um, how do you open your mind to something challenging, a structural belief, uh, so that you don't become dogmatic, but at the same time have a stable belief system that you're willing to defend? 
I don't think I, I've thought about it structurally and analyzed how I do that. Um, I listen to the people around me a lot. I don't always agree with them. And I like, I what I really, really like is having smart people around me who I disagree with. Like one of my really good friends that I've become very good friends with live, lives here in LA. When I go around to her house, all we do is argue, but we both really enjoy it. In like a fun way? Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. And and we have a great time and you know, we love each other and whatever, but but we disagree on a lot because we have different perspectives and we enrich each other and we both say, I need you, you know? So I like being surrounded by people who don't agree with me. Uh, it's why Francis and I work so well, because we're completely different people with different perspectives, different political views, different backgrounds, etc. Uh, and the rest of our team are very different people as well. Let me challenge in my own idea. Do you guys hold the similar value sets? Of course, it won't map one to one, but do you hold similar value sets or even the values you guys are? No, we different? have very similar value sets. Yeah. 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 I think that will play out over yeah. time. Hard work. Um, defiance defiance yeah interesting yeah we needed that to start we are, we're phasing that out over time hmm. but we need it we why? have to, why because, phase it out uh why phase it out because it's a it's a it's an oppositional posture that we don't need you're saying to the brand or to your personality uh look Maybe we're misusing words here. What I mean is when we started, we were like, fuck you. Yeah. And now we're like, we don't need to be fuck you because we're, we've grown so much mm. that we're not, we're the mainstream now. It reads different. Yeah. When you're a yeah. big guy yeah. saying fuck you. Yeah. It reads completely different. And we don't need it. It's like, we used to be like, well, the mainstream media is, and now we have a bigger audience than a lot of the mainstream media do. So it's kind of like, why, why would we be talking about them? Let's just do our own shit. Let's make great content, you know? Um, so that would be one. Uh, integrity. Integrity has always been number one for us. You know, how do you treat people in your life? How do you treat, you know, how do you treat your staff? How do you treat women? All of this stuff. These are all like big red flags for me. When I see somebody who's who's different in that way, I'm like, I'm staying well away from this person, you know. Um, so integrity initially was defiance, uh, resilience. Every time something goes wrong, we're like, okay, how do we get around this? Okay, cool, cool, cool. No, 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 I get it. It's bad. How do we get around this? Mm. You know, um, I'm trying to think what else. And we like to have a lot of freedom of opinion. People are allowed to express dissent or disagreement or whatever, as long as they know that having heard that, we're making the decision, mm. you know, which is what you talked about earlier. Um, haven't had dissent, uh, haven't had the rebellion anyway, um, but we'll deal with that when it comes. I look forward to that. Yeah, it's uh, running a company is, is the ultimate test it is you're up against the market you're the best thing about running a company is the people in the company yeah the worst thing about running a company is the people in the company yeah. and it's so funny how they'll all have life drama just like staggered so just when you think like okay everybody's back on task now then the next person and it it i mean when you have a a group of people that are together for a long time. I mean, you go through birth, you go through death, you go through cancer scares and it's fucking, it's like a whole thing, man. It's mm. a whole thing. And holding that together as you scale is really, really hard. And that's why I think that I'm so fiendishly focused on culture because you begin mm. to realize, oh wait, we're so big at Quest. We had 3000 employees spread across the world and they're all over the place. And if you don't have a culture that propagates the ideas mm. they they won't all be able to have a relationship with you like you will scale to the point where most of your employees only know you as the guy on camera mm. that's a trip mm. and so how do you navigate that mm. how do you get the ideas to spread and the answer is culture mm -hmm. and so that's why whether it's in a company whether it's in a family whether it's myself how i think about me it's like you have to have a set of things that you're like, these are the rules mm -hmm. that I'm gonna operate by, that mm -hmm. my family's gonna operate by, that mm -hmm. my company's gonna operate by, that I wanna see the world operate by. Mm -hmm. And yeah, rules and rules of thumb, man. Those are the, and when I say rules of thumb, I mean the beliefs, 
that you're like, okay, when this happens, you should usually do this, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, you can't have no rules as we've been talking about yeah. for the last two hours. Yeah, you'll yeah. really be in trouble. Yeah. Do you want to keep going through this? Uh, if you've got more to add to that, yeah, I'm all for it. Because I want to make sure that people walk away knowing, okay, this is this is how I need to position myself in order to do well in this crazy time. I think, I mean, look, every time I look at it, steer by results just goes in my head. That's what I see. I think almost- Walk me through how you do that. So what metric do you use when you're trying to steer by results? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, because in our industry, you would think it's clicks, mm. but it's not just clicks, because if you just care about clicks, you get to a very dark place very quickly, especially if you're mission driven, mm. right? That takes away from the mission. So part of it is mission, part of it is financial goals, revenue growth, uh, profitability growth. Uh, part of it is the vibe at the place. I mean, that's so important, the vibe in the business, how people feel about working there. This is, to me, really, really important. And then there's also, you know, we are on the cusp of, of going like properly mainstream now. So Audio Boom, which is a company that used to host our podcast and sell ads for us, they've just uh, announced a big drop in sales. It was announced on Sky News and they were like, this platform hosts blah, 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 and trigonometry. We interviewed a guy called Lawrence Fox recently, who's a very controversial figure in the UK. Every big media outlet in the UK wanted him and he only wanted to do it with us. Wow. And the BBC and the independent newspaper live reported from a trigonometry interview. So that's impact. Uh, we have people calling us up and go, oh, hey, I'm at the, I'm at the Conservative Party conference. Uh, a bunch of people here listen to your stuff. Hey, I'm at the Labour Party conference, the left-wing party in the UK. We, there's a bunch of people who listen to your stuff, right? Uh, we're changing We're changing the culture. We're, people are hearing what we're talking about, and then they're going out into the world with those conversations in their minds. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few different metrics there. It's interesting. <laughs> Lisa and I say that laughter is a metric. Mm -hmm. To get to that idea of what's the vibe how are people feeling i think that's really important this is to all my entrepreneurs listening right now this is where a lot of people make a mistake they don't know what metric to look at mm. and you have to get very good at identifying the metric that matters and so yes at a high level everybody should know to pay attention to revenue and profitability um, but there are going to be more metrics than that as you get more granular on the thing. Like each thing is going to have its own metric that really matters. If you can't identify the metric that is meaningful to adjust or you're not paying attention to metrics at all, you're not going to be able to improve. So mm -hmm. I forget who said it, but what gets measured gets improved. Mm -hmm. So one, be careful what you measure. Two, make sure that you're measuring things so that you can fiendishly improve because ultimately I think that this is the beef that I have with people that have political pressures is take uh, education in America. Education in America, as far as I can see, I don't have kids, but <clears throat> it, it just looks like a disaster. Mm -hmm. And when I compare it to um, Jeffrey Canada, who I'm almost certain I mentioned in our last interview, uh, he's created these charter schools that are unbelievably successful. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a question of, well, by what metric, Tom, are they unbelievably successful? And so the ultimate metric to me, obviously, is um, the life satisfaction of the students over a long period of time. Uh, but in the interim, we're going to have to measure something that is far more immediate. So graduation rates, uh, reading rates, mathematical literacy, things like that. And he just crushes mm -hmm. everybody on every metric you could think to measure. And he puts people it he does he puts these charter schools in other schools so literally same building in terrible neighborhoods mm -hmm. he doesn't hand select students it's all random so like if you had twins maybe one of them goes to the charter school and the other goes to the normal school in the same building um and so that's somebody who's just steering by results like how many of my students are graduating how many can read how many can do math um, and I'm sure they have more with like rules and politeness and I don't, those I'm guessing at, but, um, knowing how you would have to get there. In fact, I 
I know that they do this. They use a ton of like rules uh, that you have to like do the work. You can't um, like waste somebody else's time. Like it's all hyper regimented, hyper structured. There is a clear set of rules. People abide by the rules or they get the fuck out. Like that's the path. Mm. That's Absolutely. Enough. I'm curious to ask you something. Let me hand this back to you. you. You said something about how my personality is scary. Is that were those the words? Personality is scary. No, I did not say that. Are you talking about your persona? Persona. Yeah. 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 In that you um, you engage with the negative comments on Twitter. You will retweet somebody and be like, this is fucking asinine. I can't believe you said that. You know, you're very. Um, erudite in the way that you speak but that's the like message you're like this is fucking stupid yeah uh that is yeah i would never it's also a it comedian thing i used to be a comedian so when you get heckled your job is to deal with it right yeah so like somebody i i tweeted something uh, the other day and somebody replied saying have you looked in the mirror and i went why is my hair off you know it's just like little jokes you know to kind of like make fun of somebody or make yeah. fun of something that they've said and to diffuse whatever it is that they've mm. said, right? Because that's that's power. It's like, I haven't taken you seriously and I've made fun of this thing that you've said yeah. without any great, you know, one of the impacts that my friend with whom I argue a lot has had on me is we have both become much more chill about the way we communicate online. Um, Why, because you don't need to convince them anymore? Uh, because for me, I, I feel a sense of responsibility to, to be communicating in ways that are more effective. And sometimes going too hard is an indulgence of your Agreed. own emotion. Agreed. <clears throat> so I, I try not to indulge that too much. Uh, and also one of the things I've really noticed, and we talked about it um, at a party that you and I were at, is what you put out into the world is what comes back to you. So when I used to go hard in the paint on Twitter or whatever... Like, yeah, I used to get fouled a lot. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, now, a good way to say it. now I'm much more chill and it's rare for people to, to be that way with me. And also it doesn't land the same because I'm like, I'm putting good energy out there. So if you're being a dick, that's not because of me. That's because you're a dick, mm. you know? Um, yeah. But it, it was interesting that you mentioned that. You, look, you are a much, uh, I, th I think you're much less aggressive than I am in, in many ways. Yes. <laughs> it's interesting. Um... In some ways, mm. here's where I'm hyper aggressive. Mm -hmm. If somebody is fucking with my business, yeah. I'm very aggressive yeah. because now you're fucking with the team, yeah. you're fucking with my mission. So, <laughs> and the way that people fuck with my company would be um, not just competitors, obviously that, but more so like uh, you're doing a service for me and you're moving slowly, things like that. On that, I am not mean. Mm. I don't want people to, that's what I'm saying. Aggression mm. does not mean that you're being mean. Mm -hmm. Aggression is like, if you can do it this morning, don't wait until the afternoon. Mm. Whereas most people would be like, let's do it tomorrow. Mm. I'll get that, all, I just had it today. Hey, let's have another call on Thursday. Why the fuck would we do that? Right now, do it mm. right now, mm -hmm. share your screen, Pull the thing up. And so admittedly, I'm sure people played recordings of that. I sound exactly like I just sounded mm -hmm, just now. Mm -hmm. uh, that to me is so crazy that I am very impatient with things like that. Um, I love it. I'm very aggressive with things that I know are going to make somebody's life better. Mm -hmm. So the example that I think would really, people would be scandalized to see what I was like in the earliest days of Quest because Lisa and I made a decision that we were going to consider felons for um, a role at the company. Mm -hmm. And that meant that we ended up having felons mm -hmm. that were at the company. Now, it wasn't just like, oh, you're a felon, therefore we're going to hire you. It wasn't like that. But it was like, hey, put the word out. Whether you have felony conviction or not, we'll consider you for employment. And so we ended up having Bloods and Crips working on the same line. And we had uh, one guy, I'm sure there was more than one, uh, but we had one guy that was, he originally took the job because he needed a front for his drug money. So he needed to be able to show his parole officer, see, I have a job. Uh, but in reality, he planned to make all of his money off of selling drugs. Mm -hmm. And he told me that because he ended up, I was, 
his is a very funny story. So in the interview process, uh, because we were considering people with felony convictions, we had people lined up around the building mm -hmm. for interviews. Mm -hmm. And so I used to interview people, multiple people at a time. You know how you can just look at somebody and tell that they're sharp? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at this guy and I can tell this fucking guy's smart. He's not saying a word, mm. but he's mad dogging me the whole interview. And so I point at him, like literally, you, you have anger management problems. And he just went ghost white and he didn't say a word. And I said, uh, I wanna take you for a walk. He's like, okay. So I took him for a walk and I'm like, look, dude, looking at you, I can tell you're sharp. And so we started talking about life and he was like, um, at the end of all of it, cause I was like, look, I'm going to give you a shot. Like I can tell there's something here, but you can't bring that anger onto my floor. If you fucking fight even one time, you are gone. And he was, he goes, how did you know? So how did I know what he said? How did you know? I have anger management problems. I came here from a court appointed anger management session. And he was like, the fact that you could tell, he was like, I, I just, I need to know how you knew. And I was like, dude, you're fucking like literally looking at me like you want to kill me. You're in the job the interview whole, yeah. staring at me like crazy. Exactly. Yeah. And so I was like, uh, that didn't really take a genius. But <laughs> honestly, it was more the willingness to be aggressive, the mm. willingness to point at somebody who you know is potentially dangerous. Because I mean, this was like people with teardrop tattoos, and mm. which I asked means they put in work for the neighborhood, mm. which they will not come out and tell you what put in work means, mm. uh, but I'm sure you can figure it out. Yeah. When I know I'm helping people, mm -hmm. I am shockingly aggressive. Mm. And this is the thing that my team here has been trying to get on camera for a while, which is the side of me I only know how to bring out on stage. Mm. Where on stage, I'm like, I have 60 minutes with these motherfuckers to change their life forever. And somebody's paying me a lot of money to be here. Mm. So I have this real sense of urgency. And so oftentimes when I start a talk, I'm like, hey, we've only got 60 minutes and I'm going to change your fucking life. But you need to take notes and you need to actually do this shit. And so it puts me in this very aggressive stance, mm. which I love. Mm. But it's because I know I'm going to help them. So on Twitter, I don't know. I don't have the same sense of like, mm. you're here because you really want help. I know what ideas are gonna help you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so anyway, there there is a lane in which I'm probably 10X as aggressive as you, mm -hmm. but 90% of my life, no. That makes sense. Why be aggressive? Why are you aggressive? Mm. I don't know that I am that aggressive anymore. As I say, I've, I've kind of softened the way I do it. Do you still feel, do you still think I am? Yeah. Yeah. Defiant, maybe not. I never would have categorized you as defiant. So the thing that you're feeling you may have changed is probably that. Mm. But um, for instance, you, you will bring people on the show mm -hmm. that you know are going to, um, they have a, a belief that's not going to make them look good. Yeah. I have a real hard time dragging people into those waters because I'm like, ugh, I don't want to see this person do that to themselves, which is bad, by the way, and I'm trying to change. This is a weakness in my personality. Mm. Uh, you have no problem with that. My job is to facilitate political discussion because what we're talking about is how to run our society. Correct. And my job is to bring people on and do one thing and one thing only which is to show the world what that person truly thinks. That is my only job. And I am meticulous and rigorous in pursuing that goal. Yep. And that means when you come on my show, my job is to keep asking you questions until what you're saying is revealed truly in its mm. boiled down form to the world. I don't actually ever bring people on to make them look bad. I and didn't say that. I know you didn't say that, but some people think that because, for example, last year we were here, we had Sam Harris on mm. the show and we asked him about Donald Trump and he said some things that send the world crazy um, and that I didn't agree with. But I and people would come up to me and Francis after that for, for still they doing like, oh, you got Sam Harris, didn't you? And I'm right. like, no. 
I didn't get Sam Harris. I didn't want to get Sam Harris. I like Sam. I respect Sam, even though I really strongly disagree with what he said. My job as the interviewer is to show the world what this person thinks about this issue about which they want to speak. Mm. I don't ever take people to a place they don't want to go. I don't ever ask people questions about things they've asked me not to talk about. Right. Well, my job is to find out exactly what you think and to show the world that. So our mission is somewhat different. Your mission is help people uh, share good ideas about how they should be, etc. Right. That's not my mission. My mission is to show people what somebody thinks. Mm. Um, and I regret that the, sometimes the impact of that is that our guests look bad. And the first thing I did when Sa that thing happened with Sam, the number one thing Francis and I did is reach out to Sam and say, look, we're really sorry that this is how this has gone down. It wasn't our intention. We were not the ones who put a clip out that makes you look extra bad. None of that is to do with us. We're grateful you came on the show. We appreciate your time. You're an absolute gentleman. Mm -hmm. However, when you interview people in, in, you know, it's called trigonometry for a reason. When you right. interview people about contentious subjects, uh, you know, the world is going to take a, a view on what on what they say. And that is the nature of cultural and political debate. Yeah, facts. Number one. The other thing about aggression is, I, you know, you mentioned me being good at debating. I mean, debating is about getting to the very root cause of what you're saying, right? In order to defeat an idea that you're advancing, I have to crystallize it down and go, that's what this person is saying. Here's why it's wrong, mm. right? And flip it. That sometimes requires a kind of a tenacity and an aggression to it. Um, and plus, it's more entertaining that way. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. I mean, like if you're watching two boxers fight, you don't want them to go, oh, oh. You, right. know, you want to see him going for it. Speaking of two boxers fighting, you had Sam and Eric Weinstein on the show. <sighs> mm. um, I mean, this I will air after your episode. Okay. So uh, how did that go? Those two I respect ferociously. Mm -hmm. I've gotten reasonably close to Eric. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know Sam as well, but had Sam on the show recently. Uh, and just every time I'm with him, even though, again, there are things that he and I don't agree on, mm. um, but I really respect Sam and I, I worry that the world has a, some portion of the world, a very terrifyingly large portion of the world has sort of balled him up and thrown him away as somebody who can help them think through very hard problems. Mm -hmm. I would say he's still one of the first people I reach for. That doesn't mean that I agree with everything that mm -hmm. he says, but it does mean that I, I want to hear what he's got to say. Mm -hmm. um, how did that conversation go? It was awesome. Uh, we talked about Israel and Palestine for about two hours. Uh, and then we did a... Did they have uh, different yes, views on it? Interesting. They did. Interesting. They did. Yeah. And one of the things that we were keen on is that while, look, from a content creation perspective disagreement is always helpful yeah that isn't we didn't set it up as a debate navigate it well yeah we didn't set it up as a debate we didn't market it as a debate it's that's just... not how it's presented mm -hmm. and there was disagreement and there were points at which i had to go okay stop we're doing it like this now um but it was very, very interesting conversation, very productive. I feel like we impacted a lot. And then we, as you know, we do a section for our local supporters, mm -hmm. which goes behind a paywall. Uh, and in that section, we talked a little bit about the last interview, Sam's falling out with Brett, who is Eric's brother. Mm -hmm. There was a whole, you know, the IDW, the intellectual dark web and all of the stuff that comes out of that. So there was a whole interesting conversation about, you know, whether Israel would have happened if Trump had been in power. Well, you, you know, I want to hear that oh, part. Oh, of course you do. Everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you have to subscribe to our locals. Um, so a lot of cool stuff happened. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was, it was a great conversation. Two brilliant minds. What made you want to bring them together? Why didn't you ball up Sam like so many other people and say, ah, Trump derangement syndrome, not worth listening to. His brain is broken. The number of people that have said that Trump broke Sam's brain. I'm, I think. I'm able to compartmentalize things uh, about people. I mean, I, I, I have a family, dad, mum, three younger sisters, who I love, all of them. They all have different opinions about stuff. They all don't agree with each other. They don't agree with me on lots of stuff. But that doesn't mean that... For example, I have been outspoken on my view of what's happening in Ukraine. 
in, in, in my vehement support for Ukraine's right to defend itself, etc. My dad takes the completely opposite view. Mm. And to me, it's an emotive issue. And to him, it's an emotive issue. But my dad is one of the smartest, most erudite human beings that I've ever been around. So am I going to throw that out because Russia broke his brain? Well, that would be insane, right? We have to, I mean, part of what we're doing here and this medium being the message is you and I, you know, earlier, earlier today, I went, I love you, I respect you, I learn from you, blah, blah, blah. I have no fucking idea what you're talking about. That is the model on which we have to operate. And I respect Sam. I think he was very courageous, raising some really controversial issues back in the day. He's one of the first people that uh, brought people's attention to woke ideology being a big problem as a left-wing liberal mm. guy. Uh, he has a lot of credit in the bank with me. A lot of credit in the bank. Now, you know, there are some people who have gone completely off the rails and you're going, well, there's not much that we can connect around. I don't feel that with Sam at all. Now, do I agree with what he said about Trump? No. Do I agree with some of the COVID stuff that he said at points? No. I think his, by the way, his take on it that he put out on his podcast recently was gave some nuance to the thing, which is kind of like I had certain opinions in different stages that evolved over time, but I got nailed for having those opinions at a different time, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I don't throw people away unless like they've really, really, really gone completely off the deep end in a direction I don't like. And I also thought, I hate people, I hate to see people ganging up on people. I hate to see people bullying people. I hate people who um, who like to pile on people in a really abusive and horrible way. And I didn't, I thought what Sam said was wrong, but I thought he was badly treated. Mm. Um, and interestingly, one of the final things he says in that second section of the interview on locals is, the reason I'm back here with you guys is you behaved in a highly ethical way around that situation. And for us, the, the reason we did that, it was not strategic. It was because we believe in behaving in an ethical way and having integrity. So, um, yeah, I mean, it never occurred to us that we wouldn't speak to Sam or, you know, Sam is canceled now. We don't really think like that. Yeah. No, I love that. I think that that's really important. And I, I have been saying for a long time now um, that I don't understand why people are looking for reasons to ignore other people, mm. to not listen to them, to not hear them out. I'm looking for reasons to learn from somebody. I'm going to guess that that has to do with, I'm very confident in my ability to parse through difficult ideas. It mm -hmm. takes me time and I wish I was faster. And that's why I would defer to you in a debate, not mm. myself. <laughs> like if you leave me alone with the ideas long enough, mm -hmm. I feel that I'll get somewhere fruitful. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it's going to take me time. And, uh, so I'm very confident in my ability to say, you can have a really smart person tell me something really fucking stupid mm. and I'm gonna run it through my filter of, is this usable? Mm. Will, is this more or less likely to, to accurately predict the outcome of my behaviors? Mm. If less likely, I will reject. If more likely, I will at least try it out and see what happens. Uh, so I have a feeling that people get lost in the sophisticated ideas, the, they just, there's so much coming at them, so much velocity of information that they just need a reason to reject mm -hmm. people, to shut them down. Uh, and then feeling righteous. I'm right, he's wrong. And that makes me feel smart because he, I used to think he was so much smarter than me and now I know he's dumb. I saw so many comments like that. I used to think Sam was smart. Now I know that he's dumb. And it's like, I worry that that's them patting themselves on the back. Oh, I'm not as dumb as I thought I was. I'm mm -hmm. smarter than Sam Harris. Um, super dangerous. Also, I'll be interested. So I'm going to give you my take on what's really going on with Sam. That's dangerous. You just talk to him. So you may have a way better idea. But I put a, a tweet thread out. And this was one of the tweet threads that made me realize getting into like, quote unquote, political think I'm just never going to do. Mm -hmm. It's so boring to me. Like I tried to really give people what I thought was a super thoughtful, useful breakdown that if you understand his way of thinking that you still don't have to agree with it, but understand how he's come to it. Because then, one, you can think through these things better in the future. And anyway, people are just like, no, Trump broke his brain. It's like, Jesus Christ, like at least address the argument. So this is my interpretation mm -hmm. of Sam. Mm -hmm. Sam. Sam has a tripwire in his mind that says, if this is an existential threat, mm -hmm. then there is nothing that I won't do to stop the existential threat from coming through as long as it's not another existential threat. And 
so it's like if you believe that that Trump could end humanity, then everything he says makes sense. Mm -hmm. But everybody wants to say that 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 wasn't the context of his comment, that they were saying that he was saying it as if that's what he thought we should have done. So everyone's like, yeah, if the thing was 100 times more lethal, then yeah, it would make sense. Yes, mother, that's his fucking point, Mm -hmm. is that if this thing is an existential threat, then we should act in this way. Mm -hmm. He believes Trump is an existential threat. And so my point is, yo, what do we do when we can't agree on when we're actually under that level of threat or not? That is a terrifying question. Mm -hmm. That is where people need to figure out, yeah, how do we? What's the metric by which you judge success? What's the metric by which we judge something where we can't see into the future um, that this actually is an existential threat? How do we navigate that? Mm Because this is going to happen again, for Mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's where I was like, yeah, I I think the problem with Sam's argument is Trump isn't an existential Mm -hmm. threat. Not existential. It's interesting because you and I have come to the exact same conclusion, which is I think the reason Sam felt the way he did about, spoke the way he did about Trump and COVID to the extent that he did, is that he assesses the threat of those two things or did assess them in a completely different way to most people. The problem with that is that, you know, if I ran in here and said, well, if you don't move that cup, we're all going to die. And then you refused and I shot you. Yeah. That kind of be it. That'd be a pretty big fucking problem. Yes. Right. So uh, I think a lot of people felt that he was misassessing the threat. And as a result, asking or proper, you know, suggesting things that were inappropriate to suggest in that situation, uh, which is my view. I also to steel man the other argument against Sam, I don't necessarily share it. Well, I don't know. Let me say it first, and then I'll I'll think about whether I share or not. Is that there is a certain kind of person who is extraordinarily well educated, well read, sophisticated, smart, refined, um, you know, aware of the complexity of the world, who just finds Donald Trump personally obnoxious. And that obnoxiousness bleeds through into the factual analysis of Trump's behavior, which is where the threat misassessment comes from, some people might argue. So it's not a logical reaction to the actual threat that Trump poses. It's a reaction to his boorishness and to his... um, this kind of like the way he speaks, you know, he's not sophisticated. He's he's not he doesn't sound educated. And I, I don't know whether he is or not. Uh, I don't think Trump is stupid at all. But but that is the sort of thing that people like to say. And, you know, California is a place there are a lot of people who think like that. Um, so I think that that's why a lot of people react to Trump the way they do. And as we talked about earlier, I think his he's prepared to say the ugly truth in a way that makes it even uglier. Well said. And people don't like that. Um, However, I do think, as I said earlier, that given a beautiful lie and an ugly truth that is made even uglier, if that is what's on the ballot, I'm going with the truth and I don't give a shit how ugly it sounds. You know, uh, and that is not a position that I would have held in 2016. I just think the nature of the problems we're now facing is so much greater than it was back then. And I warned about this. I said to people, if you allow this woke ideology to get out of control, you're going to get people who are going to come along and go, look at this, look what they created. And the vast majority of most normal people are going to go, okay, I'm with you. Because at least you're willing to be honest. At least you're willing to try and deal with the problems that that have been created. Uh, I think there's going to be a backlash against what has happened now. I've been, I, and this is what I was saying at the time. I was like, I'm not against wokeness because I'm on the right. I'm against wokeness because it's going to cause a right wing backlash, and it's a bad idea in and of itself too. Um, so I think in in that respect, 
that is, I think, where the Sam situation came from. Um, and like I said, I didn't agree with him, but I think he has lots of other valuable things to say. And by the way, in the conversation that we had with Eric, he brought up a thing that people aren't talking about. Maybe it's true or maybe not. People can make their own judgment about it. But he was like, look, Israel-Palestine is not about Palestine. It's about something else. Tell me more. It's about jihad. Hmm. These people are not upset because they care about oppressed Palestinians. They are jihadis who see the West and Israel as the enemy to be wiped out. And that is what motivates them. And therefore, we have to calibrate our response to that. That is not a point of view that you hear a lot, but it is a point of view that I think is valid. And uh, jihadi is somebody who believes they're fighting God's war. Yes. God wants this enemy wiped out. Yes. You are doing God's work if you go do that. And martyrdom in the service of jihad is the greatest achievement you can have. Mm. Therefore, to take your own life and give it for that is the greatest good. The loss of civilian life is irrelevant because if... Uh, if if a good Muslim dies in the service of jihad, he goes straight to paradise. Mm. And if you're not a good Muslim or if you're not a Muslim, your life doesn't matter because you're an infidel. Uh, that changes the calculus and the game theory of everything immediately. And that's a valuable perspective, whether it's, you know, whether you personally think it's correct or not. I think it's a valuable dimension to this conversation mm. that has to be taken into account. And Sam is somebody who provides an immense level of clarity and has done from an early point in this conversation um, about that issue, which is super important, I think. How uh, much would you give up for free speech? How far would you let people go? Well, it depends what you mean, because uh, I, for example, you know, in certain countries in Europe, it is illegal to deny the Holocaust, right? Um, in Constantin land, in Constantin is, that, is that okay? Denying the Holocaust. Yeah. It is to me, yeah. And, you know, I have family who, who di who've who died in, in that war and who were Jewish. Um, I don't personally want to... The, but but we, we've got ourselves into a bit of a confusion as a society because people confuse, uh, you know, you won't have a Holocaust denier on your podcast. Mm. That means you don't believe in free speech. That's a slightly different conversation. Agreed. Right? But I do think people should be allowed. To, look, this isn't a popular view, particularly. Uh, as someone who has experienced racism, I don't think it should be illegal to be racist, mm. right? To say racist things. Right? It should be illegal to discriminate against people because of their race and employment and in education or wherever. But people should be allowed to have and express pretty much any opinion in my view. I recognize that's not how other people think. Um, do you think that's a... Like if if the scales had to tip one way or the other, do we lean more towards people believing in free speech now in the West or away from it? Well, I, I think the scales is the wrong metaphor because I think there's some people who very strongly feel free speech is important. And mm -hmm. there are also some people who feel very strongly that feelings and, you know, protecting people from hearing things they don't like is very important. So I don't know what the balance of that is, because I think those camps are almost separate. They're not even on the same scale to some extent. Right. Um, I think if you were to poll the ordinary person, it depends country by country. I mean, in the UK, uh, we have laws against uh, we have law. It's illegal in the UK to be grossly offensive. That freaks me out. It freaks me out. When did that happen? Uh, I believe it was brought in under the Blair government. I, don't quote me on this. I could be wrong, but that's fairly recent, right. actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so between 97 and 2010, it would have come across, come in at that point, maybe even before, but it was never really robustly enforced if it had been in place. So mm. don't quote me on it, but it, it, it's it's a relatively new occurrence. Right, it's not from the 1800s. I, I don't believe so, and if it is, I don't recall, you know, when I was growing up in the UK, I don't remember hearing about people being... Mm you know, prosecuted or arrested or even having the police visit them for things that they said. And and now it's it happens. Mm. And it freaks me out. You're right. And it should. It should freak us out. Yeah. Where do you think that where where does the denial of free speech go? Well you charted it perfectly yourself. If we cannot challenge bad ideas, bad ideas thrive. And when bad ideas thrive that disconnect between reality and ideas gets wider and wider. 
and then you've you and I have both I think explained where that leads. Mm. Uh, it leads to to you know the, the the clash with reality. I mean, you can believe that gravity is not real as long as you want, but when you jump out of a window, you're going to find out. Talk to me about Russia because I think there's another element to this mm. where um, I watched the movie uh, Chernobyl. Mm. And it really freaked me out, like how being watched all the time, knowing that there are certain things that you can say and can't say, like what it does to the psyche and how um, it can lead to a nuclear disaster because you're not able to speak up. You're not able to just plain say, hey, asshole, like I can't do that because it's going to fucking melt down. Yeah. Um, you were born in Russia. Mm. What what does it do like to the vibe, I'm not sure what the right word is to use, but like, what does it do to the society when people aren't able to just be open and honest? Because there's really like fear of punishment. Mm. Well, a, a lot of people, it's obviously not comparable, but a lot of people know what that feels like now because a lot of people worry about expressing their actual mm. opinions in public. And it was funny because I was just in New York. We, we've just done a couple of weeks of a trip around the US. Uh, and I got invited to this thing that's run by a friend of mine called Thought Criminals. And it's a small group of people who uh, uh, who get together and talk about things that they believe that they can't talk about in public or mm. in their work and whatever. And they asked us, Francis and I, to speak a little bit. And, you know, I said to them, I've been in this room before. Because even in the 1980s, I remember as a little kid running around in, you know, my grandfather's kitchen and there would be, you know, physicists and biologists and musicians and artists sitting around in a small kitchen talking about the very things that they could not discuss elsewhere. That's a lot of trust, man. Yeah. And it didn't always work out. So in my <laughs> grandfather's case, in one of gatherings of this kind, he criticized the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And within very short order, he was fired from his job. His wife was fired from her job and both their children, that's my father and my aunt, were kicked out of university. He had the KGB searcher's house. Uh, they found a uh, radio receiver that he used to listen to uh, BBC World Service and Voice of America. And you couldn't, you were, you were not allowed to. Mm. This was a terrible crime. Uh, and so eventually that's actually in part why I ended up in England because he couldn't remain in the Soviet Union. And as it was sort of tapering out at the end, he left and went to the UK. And then when my parents had a bit of money, they sent me to boarding school to England to be there. Uh, but my point is, it, it creates, and to this day, we don't actually know what people in Russia think about the war, for example. We don't. Uh, because what polling says isn't necessarily <laughs> reflective because Russians learn, and other people in the Soviet Union learn over a long period of time, that you have a public reality, you have a mm. work reality, and then you have the kitchen table reality. And some of these can be in complete contradiction to each other. Mm. Um, and it, it creates a culture of fear in which, as you say, people are afraid to speak up, people are afraid to take initiative. That's the worst thing. Imagine a business where people don't take initiative because mm. they're afraid. How, if you, you have a bunch of people working for you, how bad would the product that you produce be if none of them ever felt able to say, well, actually, why don't we do it like this? Let's try that. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Oh, if, yes. if everybody was constantly worried about protecting their job and therefore didn't innovate, didn't do anything different, didn't try things, didn't challenge authority, didn't challenge the people above them and so mm. on. Like that, it's a very stifling atmosphere. And it's extraordinary to me how successful the Soviet Union was in competing with the world superpower in spite of that system. It shows you the incredible talent and intellect of the people of the former Soviet Union who really, uh, you know, punched above their way, in my opinion, mm. given the terrible structures that they were operating in. Yes, this is the thing that scares me. And this is why I think what we're calling it, this, this will be interesting. I'll try to dissect my own argument here. This is the thing that I find terrifying is that even in a country like that, that has what I would call very bad ideas, mm they are able to be successful to a certain point. And so somebody that's going to attack me, if I were going to steel man their argument, I would say, look at China, look at what they've done, look at Russia, look at what they did. I mean, they, for a long time, they were the other superpower. And yes, 
they've had sort of a blip and for a while they struggled, but it's like, you know, they're kind of coming back. Like you, depending on how you look at what Putin is doing, he's God, this is not me saying this. I want to be very clear, <laughs> but like reunifying, mm. you know, the, the country or however it's thought of. And so as somebody who has read the Gulag Archipelago, who's read um, Mao, the unknown story, who's read the Red Famine, Jesus, uh, it really is, it's really distressing depending on what it is that you value because this stuff will go on for a long time. Like a lot of people died in the Red Famine, but the country didn't go away. Mm -hmm. Like they still, like they managed to like, re, you know, figure some things out and keep going. And even when the Soviet Union fell, it's, not like Russia fell into the sea, like they, you know, they build back and countries fragment, but they start doing their own thing. And so it really comes down to what vibe do you get when you think about, and I'll just make this about work, as you were talking, I was like, oh man, that's actually a really good analogy. The way that I view what happens when you lose free speech is what most people experience every day at work, mm -hmm. where, oh, Think about how much, like you think your boss is an idiot, but you're like, I can't say anything because if I do, then I'm gonna get fired or whatever. That's what it would be like. And so I don't know why people are racing towards it when they're busy hating their job and they think, you know, they work for a moron, but they can't say anything and they complain about it and they want out and they wanna do their own thing. But yet there's like this cultural movement that will yield the same result. So in at Impact Theory, dude, you can't imagine how many times to my own team I've given the speech Nobody here is above criticism, least of all me. Mm -hmm. I am not smart enough to take us where we want to go. I need people to tell me when I'm going awry. I need people, like you are literally being hired for two things. Are you willing and able to make decisions and stand by them? And can you speak to power? Mm -hmm. Because if you can't speak to power and you're not willing to tell me what you really think, we're going to crash and burn. Have you heard about um, South Korean airlines and how they used to have the worst safety record in, in the entire industry? Okay, this is crazy. This to me is what happens when free speech goes away. So they have a cultural thing there where you respect your elders. Yes. So if the captain outranks you and you're in the plane uh, and you're the co-pilot and something's going wrong, you can make suggestions, but you can't like snap them out of it. And so they have these black box recordings, do this eerie, they did this whole uh, documentary of black box reenactments uh, of these famous plane crashes. And there were a couple in there from South Korea. And it goes like this. Uh, excuse me, pilot, um, do you think we're getting a little close to that mountain? No, 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 everything's fine. Uh, excuse me, sir, could it be possible that if we were to pull up that we'd be in a better situation? I told you to maintain your course. They are careening towards a fucking mountain, man. They eventually crash into that mountain. And at no point does the co-pilot go, hey, motherfucker, we're gonna run into the mountain and we need to pull up. What the fuck are you doing? Hmm. And that to me is when you lack free speech, you get Chernobyl, watch it if you haven't, you get South Korean Airlines. They finally had to do this whole like cockpit protocol where in the cockpit you could absolutely, it did not matter, hierarchy was gone. So whatever, like before you clock in, whatever deference you're showing somebody, the second you clock in that goes away, mm. you've got to say exactly what you think is true. You've got to be assertive. You've got to be willing to call it. Mm. And I was just like, wow, like there are real consequences when people aren't for whatever reason compelled to say what they think is true. And the most beautiful illustration of that is the movie Crimson Tide. Have you ever seen it? I have, but a long time ago. Denzel Washington and uh, Gene Hackman, I think. Yes. And that's the whole plot of the movie. It's the captain of the boat and his XO, and there's a decision to be made and the XO is doing everything he can to prevent a bad decision from being made by the captain mm. who's chosen a particular path to pursue. And the entire movie is about that fact. And at, at the end, the way that that whole thing is shown as being the, the true value of not just free speech, but honor in that whole system is... Uh, what happens is they end up not launching nuclear weapons at my boys, <laughs> uh, as it was a Cold War movie. And it turns out to be the right decision. Mm. However, there is a mutiny aboard a nuclear submarine, which is a pretty big fucking deal, Wolf. right? So there is some kind of investigation and the captain is 
questioned about what happened, but his exo is not in this courtroom, the military court martial mm-hmm. or whatever it is. And they bring in Denzel Washington, who's the exo, and they say, and, you know, we've made a decision, something like this. And he goes, what, without my testimony? And they say, you know, Captain Ramsey, who is the captain of the boat, I've known him for 30 years. You know, we don't we don't need to. We don't need to mistrust him. Right. Mm. And the point is that at the end of that whole process, the captain who fought so hard to have his decision implemented knows he fucked up and he's willing to admit it. That's the whole point of the movie. Mm. Right. And it ends by I think the final shot of the thing is uh, since then they've changed the protocol on the submarines so Mm. that you can't, you need, I think, you know, they've changed the whole thing basically, right? So you no longer have that conflict, which is exactly what you're talking about, Mm. right? A situation, someone speaks up, that speech is eventually heard. People cling more to what's important over what is in their own personal interest, right? Mm. Because there's a bigger thing at stake uh, and lessons are learned. That's that's like the whole thing in, in in a movie. That's why free speech is important because it prevents you from making mistakes in the future. You've said that every generation has to fight for free speech again. Mm. Why? What what is the so I'm this is my bias. There's some biological thing that makes people want to shut down free speech mm. for whatever reason, and then there's some biological reason why people want it on the other side. Now, I think we've made a pretty we've laid out why it can be wildly problematic to not have free speech mm. but what's the pull on the other side why why does every generation have to fight this over and over well free speech is kind of unpleasant isn't it isn't it it can be man so no I'll, it is it is i mean when we think in what about- way because people say things that make you go oh yeah that was kind of stupid of me uh or they just say things that you don't like or they express opinions you don't agree with, right? For example, I feel very strongly about what's happening in Ukraine, yep. right? So for me, hearing people saying horrible shit about Ukrainians who are fighting for their lives and calling them Nazis and lying about that whole situation, mm-hmm. it upsets me, or it could do if I let it. And at some points I let it, it's a fact. What if I could just press a button and then none of these people ever say any of that again? Mm. Wouldn't my life be so much more improved? Right? Definitely not. But that could be because I'm already so far down the path. Yeah. So you understand that my life would not be improved. Mm. But a lot of people don't understand that because it's reaction, stimulus reaction. That's all it is. Oh, I feel bad. Okay, shut it down. That's how a lot of people feel about life in general because most people, as you well know, don't go through life not feeling in control. And so when a thing happens that you don't want to experience... That's what happens. Mm. That's what it's it's a, quite a natural instinct. And so in many ways, I would argue free speech is very unnatural. It's a very unnatural thing. And that's why it has to be fought for repeatedly because people, it's always tempting to go to the, shut it down. I don't like to, I don't want to hear this, mm. you know. Uh, and also, you know, if your ego is invested, this is the hardest thing for people who do what you do and do what I do, you know, whether you run a small YouTube channel or a massive business, Everyone has an element of ego that takes ages to get rid of, you know, to process and to, to, and so it's a, it's a challenge to your ego to have people challenge the things that you uh, are, are, are saying or believing or thinking. And it's only when you transcend that and you go, this is about something bigger than me. Mm-hmm. This is what you said about the speech you give your team, right? You said, if we're going to get to where we want to go, mm-hmm then you have to be able to challenge me. But if all we are trying to do is get to where I want to go, maybe I don't need to hear your crappy opinion about how I'm doing anything. Or maybe I just need you to suck up to me so that we carry on doing stuff that makes me feel good. An owner will never do that. Eh, A successful owner will never do that because they know that at the end of the day, the rubber meets the road. If you get a company, I guess, that's like, finally hit escape velocity and it's just making enough money, then you can start being stupid. But this is why the average company now stays in the S&P 500, I think for 12 years. It used to be 61. Right. If you made it to the S&P 500, baby, gravy train, 61 years, mm-hmm. now 12. Yeah. Bananas. So anyway, there's just a death spiral that happens when you uh, 
want people to suck up. It's really interesting. So I came to being a CEO through a very weird way. I started as a copywriter, worked my way to partner in one company, and then tried to quit that company. And so they made me an equal partner in the next company. Long story, my audience has heard me tell the story a thousand times. Uh, and so that, I was like, I clawed my way to the top in, in a very uh, emotionally difficult environment mm -hmm. that was the intellectual equivalent of Thunderdome. Like we actually used to say that. This, this is not me like making it up. It was like one man or two men enter, one man leaves. Like we used to talk about that all the time. And so it, it really was meant in some ways to be that difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as I looked at it and was like, mm, how much of this works, how much of it doesn't, there were some ideas that were brilliant, like challenge me. Uh, other ideas that were less likely to make it with me when I was on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, and like what? Like I realized very quickly that I need to give my power away. Mm. So my job in getting to the CEO position is not to flex and show everybody how powerful I am. My job at getting to CEO was to empower everybody else so that it could scale. And that is very difficult to do, mm -hmm. to claw your way to that role and then be like, hey, actually, for me to get where I want to go, I have to, in some ways, in some ways, it, it actually be really interesting. It would take us hours to really explain what running a business is. Mm. But in many ways, you're, you're, sub, um, you're submitting yourself to your employees mm -hmm. and you're saying, uh, one, we, I actually don't refer to my employees as my employees, just psychologically, I don't, it's not the right move. So we refer to each other as teammates. Yeah. That's so what on, I call my, my, I call, dude, call I'm them telling my you, team. The psychological thing that does, I think is very important. We mm -hmm. also give equity to our team. So it's like, Hey, you actually really own a piece of this company. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, we're pulling for the same thing. We're teammates. You're not my family. I'm holding you to a standard. I absolutely expect you to perform well. Uh, I consider myself to need to be um, as good as a human could be at my position. Mm -hmm. So I know what my position is. I'm not, I am not interested in being a micromanager, but I have to like, hey, how are things going for you? I wanna make sure that you have, the way that I refer to myself is I'm the soil. You guys are the things that are gonna grow. Mm -hmm. And so my job is to create the soil here that, freedom of speech, challenge authority, all of that stuff is incredibly important to create that kind of um, vibe so that you can ultimately get the things you wanna go. But as that, one, to create that is very difficult because I think, and this is the next thing I wanna talk about, that there is part of the reason I think that people have to fight for free speech every generation is that there is innate in humans, partly because of ego, partly because of fear, partly because of insecurity, partly because it's awesome, is a drive for totalitarian style control. Yeah. And I've often thought it's really good that I'm not smart enough to lead this company in a dictatorial fashion. Hmm. Because if I were right, like say 85% of the time, mm -hmm. I could probably get away with it. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that I'm not. And so I never worked with Steve Jobs, so maybe I'm wrong and this is just mythology, but I have a feeling he was just smart enough that he could just like slap people around, be absolutely horrible, tell them what to do, and it still worked. And they built an amazing company. And so very few people were like, he's a lot of fun to work for. So I can't do that. I can't deploy that mm. methodology because if I'm a dick to you, I'm gonna be wrong way too frequently and now I'm just gonna hemorrhage human capital. So anyway, I think that's a big part of the, the pool pull is that, uh, being a dictator feels awesome. Hmm. Telling Does it people, though? Does it? See, I, people say that, but I, look, I, I've never been inside another human being's skin, obviously, but... Uh, it's insecurity provoking. Is that where you're going? No. I. Why? It just doesn't feel good. Why, why not? Because you're making other people feel bad. Do you think they see that? Yes. Because some of them, like when I heard stories about uh, Saddam Hussein's son, yeah, yikes, yeah. So I suppose there are some psychopaths, and they probably <laughs> accumulate at the top of Fortune 500 right. companies. Um, it's weird to me. I've never, I've never been because uh, I fear in myself the the instinct to authoritarianism. Mm. But when I actually started managing our team, 
I quickly realized that I actually didn't need to fear that at all because I'm actually the opposite. I have to force myself to say things that might not be pleasant for them, mm. but that need to be. It's, it's something I have to overcome all the time. I, I do not enjoy making other people feel bad one bit. And dictatorial... I won't say that's the only part of being a dictator, though. It's not. Because when you run a company, I like knowing I'm the one person that can't be fired. They can all quit. And yeah. I think I think people working at a company underestimate how brutal that is. But they can't fire me. Mm -hmm. And that feels nice. It, well, yeah. But does that make you a dictator, though? There's an element of that. I have the the quote unquote totalitarian control over my company. People are going to do what I say. And it ultimately, it forces you into a George Washington position where it's like, I could keep this power, mm -hmm. but I actually am going to give it away. Mm -hmm. And in the way that he gave it away because he felt it was the right thing for the country. And it's probably good that he was as old as he was because he was just like, Jesus Christ, this is a pain in the ass. Yeah. And I would really like to retire to my farm now. Uh, there, there is something about that feeling of like, as long as the company is making money and I can't be fired, this is why I don't take money. I don't take outside money because then you can be fired. The board can fire you. Mm -hmm. And I would hate that. Anyway, I get your point. It's, it's a mixed bag. And I suppose the fact is that, as we talked about, people have different psychological profiles. There are some people who are psychopathic, mm. right? Um, we we're talking about authoritarianism, though. Why we always have to fight every generation for free speech? Because it's not natural. <laughs> That's why. It's, it's, it's not a natural state of, of being, I think. Uh, I don't think that in, in the ancestral environment, in a tribe of 150 people, there was a huge amount of free speech. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, so I think it's a quite artificial idea in some ways. Uh, that's why it hasn't been around for very long in historical terms. I mean, the idea that freedom of expression matters is sort of a few hundred years old at best, actually, and never really been properly implemented anyway, even in those times. Now, look, the, pro the reason we keep banging on about free speech, we should acknowledge this as well, is the technological environment is very different. Mm. Uh, a word said in private 200 years ago really probably didn't have a huge amount of impact on how people thought and felt and whatever you say something on twitter now it could be seen by hundreds of millions of people and have far-reaching implications so even though language hasn't changed that much the impact of language has and i can see why you know i don't believe there's ever going to be a free internet again you know there was a there was a there was a gold rush moment in of the internet do you remember it when you say free you mean uncensored yeah mm. yeah that's not going to happen again it's just the technology is too powerful. Mm. But it, 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 you, nobody would allow that. Uh, what do you think again. about what Elon is doing with Twitter? What specifically? Yeah, that's interesting. So the way that I see it is him taking over this thing, making it open source so people are not open source, but um, transparent so everybody can see what the algorithm is. And um, there's no mystery about who's getting blocked or why. And th that part of it I like. That part of it I like, but I think um, I've ne I never met Elon. I actually did Bill Maher's show with him today, but we didn't get a chance to talk. So I don't know what he's like. I've never mm. met him, and I'm just saying this as an outside observer. And I actually think he's a very important figure in the culture and what he's attempting to do in terms of the survival of humanity. Actually, really important. I disagree with him about certain things. But you have to be honest and recognize that Twitter is a benevolent dictatorship which is much better than the, the oligarchy we had before. It is better. But I see that there is, you know, any dictatorship is benevolent as long as it's benevolent. Mm -hmm. right? um, so, you know, for example, uh, Twitter, I think, is in a bit of a standoff with Substack at the moment, uh, which for someone who writes on Substack, I find it a little bit frustrating. What's the standoff? Uh, the standoff is that Substack came up with a thing called Substack Notes, which I think the people at Twitter believe is an attempt to compete with Twitter, hmm. which I don't think it is, given that Substack, I think, have you know, like 35 million subscriptions versus whatever Twitter has. You know, they're not comparable. But um, 
th there's been some things that happened on that front that make me, you know, make me think that, you know, I really wish this dictatorship remained benevolent for mm -hmm. as long as possible. Is he throttling Substack people or something? Like if you're trying to link out to it or? I don't have access to the actual data to be mm. able to say accurately. There was a period of time, it was quite short, when if you posted a Substack link on Twitter, it would actually, if you clicked it, it would be, it would take you to a page saying this link is unsafe. Interesting. And if you tweeted a link to, to Substack, you couldn't like or retweet it. Hmm. You could only quote tweet it. So it was direct suppression of these right. things. This happened for a very short period of time. Uh, and then we are in a position where we are now where some people say suppression is going on quietly and some people say it's not. Mm. You know. hmm. Interesting. Well, if he makes the code available, people real fast point out whether that's really happening or not. Yeah. But that's interesting. Okay, so free internet was a moment going away. Um, it becomes a very interesting question getting back to, do we want freedom of speech? How far in uh, kissing land mm -hmm. we're gonna go? What I we're gonna- I am so grateful I'm not Elon. I cannot tell you. Just the pressure or what? The, the, that decision, that specific one decision mm. is like, where's that line? Nobody knows, nobody knows. Because once you go from anyone's allowed to express an opinion, which I genuinely believe. Mm. Like you and I sitting here without the cameras on, if you want to be racist, I may not stick around, but I believe you have a right <laughs> to say that, right? Mm. What about when that is recorded on camera and it goes out to millions of people? What if I say, as David Icke, this conspiracy guy in the UK said at the beginning of the pandemic that COVID is caused by 5G, mm. and then the next day people go out and burn down 5G masks, right? You know, the, I was abhorred, I found the decision to, that's not, probably not even a word, I found the decision to ban Trump from Twitter abhorrent. Yeah. But I can also, if I'm being intellectually honest, I opposed it completely and I said it at the time. I can find it in my mind a situation in which a leader of a democratic country, in my opinion, should be banned from the public square. Really? Yeah. Give me an example. Well, it's obvious if they're inciting large scale mass violence, for example, they're mm -hmm. saying, you know, what we need to do is go out and shoot these people. Right now. I don't think Putin tweets, but would you <laughs> boot him if he did? Because there is a guy. Oh, God, I follow him. I forget his name mm. on the Russian side. Because I was like, oh, my God, like he's tweeting what he really thinks about the West. Medvedev, this is crazy. Yes. Yeah, he drinks a lot. And I was like, whoa, like this guy's just not pulling any punches. Yeah. Like these idiots and all this. I was like, wow, like, okay. This is why I'm saying I'm grateful not to be in the position where I have to make these decisions because I think at the end of the because day- Because there's no right answer. There's no right answer. Now, we're all fighting mm -hmm. over where that line is. And my argument is that line has been pushed way in against free speech. I think that's Elon's point and that's why he's taken over Twitter and that's why he's mm. rolling that line back. But inevitably, there will always be a point where you go, okay, that, that's far enough, I think. Yeah. Because the technology is too powerful now. The impact of words is so, can, is not, but can be so catastrophic. Yeah. But then again, I can see counter arguments to my own argument. I mean, think about, you know, what about the civil war in America? A bunch of people saying, you know, we must end slavery. And if people want to fight us over that, we got to go out and fight. Mm. What if that happened today? What if people went out and said, you know, we got to fight whatever, and that means we need to pick up our weapons and go to the street. Do you interfere with that as the owner of Twitter? Most people out there in the world do not care about being perceived to be moral or being perceived to be virtuous or being perceived to be anything. They care about some very simple things like money, oil, precious metals, rare earth metals, land, force, power, military capacity, right? This is what they care about. And to the extent that they are able to achieve that, they will pursue that by any means necessary. You see this with what Russia is doing, you see this with what other countries are doing. Um, they are pursuing their interests as they understand them by any means necessary. And if we cut off our ability to do the same, because we go, oh, this is dishonorable, it's dishonorable to use force. It's dishonorable to have 
regions of the world under our power, under our influence. Why should we be involved in this country far, far away? Well, the reason is that's how you make America prosperous and safe. Right. But nobody wants to say that because in the world that we live in, it's dishonorable. It doesn't sound good. Right. The truth is, you know, I remember in, I said this on Twitter recently in 1990, in, in the 90s and the noughties, you had all these American movies in which some CIA guy would be like, and they hate us because we have freedom. And I was like, no, idiot. They hate you because you have power. That's why they hate you. People don't want to hear this, but on 9-11... Most of the world cheered. It wasn't because they hate your freedom. It's not because most of the world is jihadi terrorists. People don't like the people at the top of the pyramid. Everybody wants to take your place. And that is the simple truth of the world. And unless you're willing to stand in that place and defend it, someone will come and take it away from you. It's no different to cartels in, in Mexico, right? Once they sense a weakness in the strongest cartel, what happens? Someone comes after it, it fragments, they form a new thing, they start again. That's how power works, and there's no escaping it. On the, the power front, mm. um, and then I'll come back to the, the beliefs that lead us astray. On the power front, yeah, it, the truth of the world is, is deeply uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and there's something very weird about that nature is red in tooth and claw. So for anybody that's heard that but never stopped to think about it, uh, what it means is you stop your enemy. And unfortunately, I'm actually really curious to get your emotional take on. So I've seen a lot of the footage coming out of the Israel-Hamas conflict. Mm -hmm. It's doing something to me that I really don't like the way it makes me feel. And I watched one today. Wow, I'm getting emotional. I watched one today where um, there was... a. Uh, somebody from Hamas going through and they had a camera like a GoPro or whatever on their head and they're just filming it and through the window they shoot and kill somebody you can't really see it but you hear the person die it's crazy and then um, that person ends up getting shot and killed and I just thought to kill another human you rip their body like you tear a hole in their organs they bleed out it's violent and painful and simple and fast and watching that person die i mean they die fast man like at the end somebody shoots them i don't know sniper what single shot not even like a da -da -da -da, just pow drops you hear him he's talking it oh dude it was just so crazy and that nature is red in tooth and claw we have not escaped nature Mm -hmm. Not entirely, but there is something about how much progress we've made that is thrilling. And when I think about how much prosperity and how much um, peace the Western world on our home turf, because I am well aware of mm -hmm. the horrendous forever wars that we have gotten into, but on our own home turf, how much of that we have had and what scares me is that it's huge blessings, huge blessings, and also seems to derange our thinking in some oh. way. Going back to the idea some people need to be chased by a lion. Like there is something about human nature that has to be, not has to be, this is the wrong way to think about it. If it isn't kept in check, that, that a way of thinking becomes pathologized and we the, the, oh God, I'm explaining an idea that I have not had to articulate out. This is why I love having you on. Uh, the group begins to vibrate. Stick with me. Mm -hmm. The group begins to vibrate. It sounds like a sexual fantasy, mate. Mm, let's see. <laughs> oh, it doesn't end like one. I don't think. Not for me. <clears throat> uh, the group begins to vibrate. And the individual gets lost. Collective thinking takes over and all hell breaks loose and that all hell breaks loose can be just a uh, a weakening and so a stronger force from the outside comes in and takes over or it can be um i'd have to really think about times where the group the collective becomes like a, a mao's china or something like that um that worries me the deranging of that to keep it on things that we've already talked about in this conversation 
when you get the pulling all of the structure apart so that there is nothing left to push back on so that everyone is equal, everyone is the same, nobody is worse off because we have the luxury to believe that. So um, I say that because if, um, great example, if somebody broke in <laughs> to the this studio right now and they said, okay, we, um, you have to win a debate or everyone here dies. I would Im immediately go, okay, Constance is a better debater than me. So, Constantine, sorry. So, um, you, you go do the debating. Mm -hmm. And I would just have, because I don't want anybody to get shot. I don't need to be right. I just need somebody that I've seen do it and I know that they're good at it, boom. So now reality slaps you in the face and everybody lines up behind that. But when there is none of that, mm -hmm. you get this slow decay and the slow decay is hard to protect against. And that's where we are, I think. Uh, that's exactly where we are. We've become very uncomfortable with look this is a very very difficult thing to talk about okay but i think we have to talk about it particularly in this moment so i've talked to we've got a uh, i don't know when this will go out but we have an episode with sam harris and eric weinstein com oh, coming yes. out um, we talked about israel and palestine a lot and the thing that we were talking about is this world war ii ended because the United States dropped two nuclear weapons on Japan and because of what happened to Germany, okay? Now, when the United States dropped, I think it was Hiroshima, when they dropped that nuke, they, afterwards, one of those two, they went and measured the blast impact of those detonations. Not the release of energy from the nuclear weapons, which is much greater, but the blast impact. And they calculated how many conventional munitions you would have to use to achieve the same blast impact on a city. When they did those calculations, there's a Russian historian uh, called Mark Salonian who's gone through all of this. In the last year and a half of World War II, the Allies, that's mainly the Brits, the Americans and the Soviets, dropped 50 Hiroshima's a month on Germany. Whoa. Every month for 18 months. They wiped Germany off the map, flattened cities, hundreds of thousands of people burnt alive. Now, historians have come along and, say, and said that was too much, that was unjustifiable, that was wrong, etc. But the fact is that Germany was in the, death, in the grips of a death cult. Hitler said, we're going to make a final stand, we're not going to retreat, we're not going to capitulate, we're not going to surrender. Uh, and that is what happened. And the only way the Allies could win that war was to kill a hell of a lot of innocent people. Okay. Are we saying that was wrong? Are we saying that murdering, not murdering, sorry, killing millions of innocent civilians in war is wrong? Well, I think so. Don't you? Yes. Can you win a war without doing it? No. no. I don't know. I will say that. No, it you can't. Look like it. You can't. You can't. So what does that we are in? So if you accept my premise, then we are in a moral paralysis right now, because if you want to win the war, you have to kill innocent civilians and we don't want to kill innocent civilians. What's the outcome? We can't win the war. And that's where we are. That's where we are. OK, so power as the returning theme. Uh, I imagine people are getting squeamish. What you point you power keep saying at, that, but what what does squeamish mean? It means that they're going to. What I mean by that now is people are going to reject a tool because it can also be used to um, do horrendous things. So I saw a tweet um, that said there there is only tragedy in the um, Israeli Palestine conflict. Mm -hmm. There's no good that can come of it. No, nah, that's not what they said. There was only tragedy. That is what they said. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wish I had memorized it because it was a really eloquent description of it's it's not good guys, bad guys. It's just tragedy every which way you look. And 
nature is red in tooth and claw and there is tragedy to that but i don't know that there is any way to escape it and relinquishing your power is not the way to do it as somebody who thinks in movies i will remind everybody of superman 2 uh, when Superman gives up his powers because he wants to just be a normal person and be in love with Lois Lane and do the things that a normal person would do, only to then find out that he gets knocked around by the bully and to help people has to uh, get his powers back. It's interesting. I have not thought about that uh, metaphor. But yeah, that I think is the very hard lesson we're learning, that it feels really good to focus on how much I love my wife, mm -hmm. to focus on how much I care about uh, my team here at Impact Theory, mm -hmm. to focus on the people that I'm trying to help with the show. But there's a reason why I talk constantly about the imagery that I use to keep myself motivated is me in a loincloth covered in the blood of my enemies. Mm -hmm. And I have to channel that willingness to be hard, to be tough, uh, in order to stay focused, to not give up, to not fall into a weak mindset. Mm -hmm. Here's another quote that I wish I had memorized, but I'll get you close with a paraphrase. This is George Washington. Uh, George Washington said, when a group of people loses their hard fighting disposition, um, they can no longer claim themselves to be among the best. Just as cowardice is a mortal sin in the individual it is a mortal sin at the population level and i was like whoa like especially when you understand his role and what he did in order to help america get the american experiment off the ground uh, which is hopefully something we'll get to before the end of this talk like what the american experiment is why it matters why it's not owned by america one of the aspects that we're circling around here is, is sacrifice Think about what George Washington did. He led hundreds of thousands of men, many of whom were maimed and killed, into battle over what? An idea. The idea that you people in this country should be free of external tyranny. And he sacrificed men's lives to achieve it. Now, we would agree that killing people is bad, maiming people is bad. We don't want any civilian or anyone killed, do we? Because we're good, moral, virtuous people. But that is not how the world works. If you want to achieve goals, inevitably that will happen, right? If you want to defend your country, you have to sacrifice. Some men, usually men, almost always men, have to sacrifice themselves. And someone who's in charge of that will be in charge of, do we send these people here? Do we send them there? Some of them are going to die. We're in moral paralysis in the West at a level of society. We still have generals. We still have, you know, presidents who will press the button and send men into battle and whatever. But at a level of society, we are incapable of understanding that reality. We're incapable of understanding the fact that, look, the Israel-Palestine situation is a perfect example of this. If you believe that Hamas is a terrorist organization, you understand that this was Israel's 9-11 and Israel has to destroy Hamas. If Israel has to destroy Hamas, Hamas using civilians as a shield means that civilians are going to die. I don't feel comfortable being the guy, yeah, 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 press that button, go on. I'm not happy saying that. I'm not saying that. But the people making that decision if they want to destroy Hamas, have to take innocent life. That's the moral quandary that the entire world is in. And the reason that Israel is particularly in that position, it is being forced to play by Western rules against people who play by a completely different set of rules, who don't operate on those values whatsoever. It's interesting calling them Western rules. I like to think, hmm, I haven't thought about this, so I can tell that what I'm about to say is ill-informed but I'll walk through the way that I was thinking about it and then I'll sort of self-correct. Um, what I was going to say is I like to believe that as a society finds itself prosperous, uh, not quite true. 
This is how I know <laughs> this is ill-informed. Uh, okay, there are two ways to approach it. You've got the individualistic way. You've got the collectivist way. You can achieve extraordinary things through both, as China's shown over the last, whatever, 30 mm. years has been absolutely breathtaking to see that level. Um, I just have a feeling that that one deranges a little more quickly than does the individual. So if you made me place a bet on which one is uh, going to yield the best results over time, I would say that betting on the individual uh, meaning individual freedoms, property rights, all the things that we'll call Western values. Um, I think that that makes sense. I think the once you do that and you make the individual, you think of them as having a divine spark within them and that each individual is precious and, and not this disposable thing, um, that that has a self-correcting mechanism in it that leads to what we're seeing now. Now, we have looped back to beliefs that end up creating um, the, uh, the pathology and we'll, we'll keep going through some of them because I think it's pretty fascinating, but I, that to me, I think makes a lot of sense. So I want to believe that any society that bets on the, um, in elevating the individual, the individual as the, um, the right unit of account, as you begin to analyze what to do, what not to do, uh, that it requires you to look at them as sacred individuals and thusly protect them and thusly any society that goes down that path is going to find themselves not wanting to use human shields or blow up human shields. Um, so anyway, I think I navigated that reasonably well. I stopped myself from the most absurd uh, trip ups, which is that a collectivist society can work. Um, I just have a feeling that it, because it only requires one person to become pathologized, that uh, that has a tendency to end in tyranny and bad news much faster, but it's certainly not impossible for either system mm. uh, to end up there. Okay. Anything on more on that belief? No. Okay. So uh, I, ha I have more. Mm. So problematic beliefs that cause collapse that I want people to pay attention to, because if you adjust these in your own life, not only do I hope that that means the collective won't derange, that it means if we really are living through effectively the modern version of the Roman collapse. So this is gonna help you see opportunities if you can avoid these problematic beliefs. Okay, so prosperity is a fundamental law of human nature. I feel like people believe that that's true. What do you think? Dumb people believe that that's true. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe I take that back. Lucky people, people in the Western world believe that that's true because they've never experienced anything else. But that isn't the world. Uh, the world is very, very different to that. And this is one of the things I've made it my business to remind everybody, you know, we talk endlessly about all sorts of forms of privilege, this privilege, that privilege, you know, the, the real privilege that we all enjoy is Western privilege, first world privilege. Uh, and we have been very comfortable for a very long time in that privilege. And we have forgotten that life for the overwhelming majority of people throughout human history has been an immense struggle for survival. Prosperity is not a given. It is a product of the things that we have been very lucky to enjoy in the West. And the values that we have are what has allowed us to build it, which is why they're important to preserve. So prosperity, prosperity is not a human right. It, it doesn't fall out of the sky. It's not on your birth certificate. Prosperity is a product of action. It's a product of action in your personal life. It's a product of action at the level of society. For you to enjoy the prosperity that you enjoy, you have to work your butt off, as you have done, and be smart and be creative and be driven and be talented and have great ideas that you test against reality and fail and recover and adjust. That's how you build prosperity in your life. And countries are no different. I heard a really cool quote. I'll paraphrase. I mentioned it earlier. In the capitalist system, people recognize that prosperity is the miracle. In a socialist system, people get confused and think that redistribution is the miracle. Mm. So if it's true that it's the rules and rules of thumb that really are going to equate to your level of success, whether that's emotional success, financial success, societal success, <laughs> uh, what are high level rule sets? The, the two that came to mind the fastest, just at the highest, highest level were capitalism and socialism. So I was like, all right, Without looking it up, what would I define these two systems as? So for capitalism, I said individuals try to, con try to contribute to the group and prosperity is their reward if successful. For socialism, I said the group takes from the individual to divide prosperity evenly. 
And what do you think about those definitions, first of all? Pretty good. I mean, they're obviously, by definition, extraordinarily simplified. Yes. But, but broadly speaking, yes. Okay, so when you look at those rule sets, one of them, I think, acknowledges that prosperity is going to be hard to come by. That's why I said, because originally I was like, individuals contrib contribute to the group and prosperity is their reward. And I was like, hold on, because you're going to try to contribute. You may not be able to. Society may say, I don't like your contribution. The one that kills me, society may say, you're not smart enough to contribute meaningfully. That one is hard, but real. And there are going to be people that just do not have the intellectual horsepower to contribute meaningfully to society. And Hence, I like a social safety net of some kind, like mm -hmm. looking out for people, wanting to help people. I, all of that's amazing. Anyway, socialism <laughs> takes that prosperity for granted and does not realize that you can break the very thing that creates the prosperity, which is giving people the individual freedom to try to contribute to the group. And if they're able to do that successfully, that prosperity is a reward. They are able to create a differential between themselves and other people. They're actually able to do that. Now, of course, anybody that's familiar with the Gini coefficient knows that if that gap between the haves and the have-nots becomes too much, you are basically guaranteed violence mm -hmm. because people can actually be poor and it's not a problem if everyone around them is poor. Mm -hmm. Where it becomes a problem is if your neighbor is super wealthy and you're even normal, like you have a refrigerator, you have air conditioning, you have a PlayStation, like you can have it all. But if your neighbor is Elon Musk, mm. now there's a real problem. And he has right. rocket ships and <laughs> makes his own cars, all that stuff. So um, they can be a problem. But if you fail to recognize that you that prosperity is by default, everyone is broke all through human history and everyone but the smallest number of like royal people just suffered endlessly and were victims of just climate just mm. you froze to death you overheated just was or you starved to death probably even way more common all right here's a new one can we pause on nature yeah. has no rules because i think one of the interesting things about this all all of this thing is um the biggest problem with blank slatism is the attempt to pretend that human nature doesn't exist that humans are not wired to be predisposed to certain things. And it's an incredibly unscientific belief, given that we know that we evolved, we're evolved creatures, and therefore um, it, it's, it's kind of, it's obviously understandable, but at the same time very silly to think that horrible things that human beings do are some kind of weird occurrence. You know, oh, I can't believe there's a war somewhere. Really? Why don't you look at our history? When was the last time human beings were not fighting over something? We are tribal chimps that evolved to do what we do. And all of the terrible pathologies of human beings are a product of our evolution to a very large extent. So when we know that that is the case, we prepare for war and therefore are kept safe. When we pretend that is not the case, we don't prepare for war and we go, oh my God, I can't believe we've been invaded. So the denial of the existence of human nature is, is pathological and very dangerous. Yeah, this one I, I don't, this one I don't understand. And this is the thing that's really um, been an animating force for me. So as I think about, okay, impact theory, what is impact theory? It's a belief that they're, the only difference between me and the level of success that I've had in the other average people, because I consider myself very average, is a set of ideas, many of the ideas that we're talking about right now today. And the one that I find the, the most jarring that people don't just rush to embrace is that 50% of the way you work is hardwired. You're not going to get around it. And so I've thought a lot about then why is it that people can get confused mm -hmm. because they, they can get confused and they can make very compelling arguments. And so because I never want to assume that, oh, I've really got this mapped out, I'm like, okay, wait, how is it that people are so confused about this? And they're confused because there's 50% of you that is malleable and we can change a lot. So in fact, I mean, let's confront um, gender non-conforming square on. It really is happening. And a lot more people, maybe it's still a tiny, tiny number, maybe it's still only one and a half percent of people, whatever. Um, they're actually, they feel accurate in saying that 
I, while my body may be male, I am a woman. And if we can, let's, let's assume that some people at the edges are totally lying. Men, oh God, you guys have a really funny name for it. Prison onset gender dysphoria. Yeah, it's when you get, when somebody who's a trans woman, that a male with a penis gets arrested and goes to court. Suddenly they're like, oh, I, I'm a woman now. You know, ra rapid on, prison onset gender dysphoria. You see a bit of prison coming your way, suddenly you're, you're gender dysphoric. So setting <laughs> that aside, I, I have a sense that there really are people that they really do believe that. Sure. And so something is malleable enough <laughs> that they, because all, I don't even think all of them started that way. I think some people, this comes on very late in life. Um, so the question becomes, why are they able to get, and I don't mean this, this word derogatorily, why are they able to get confused? Why are they able to be migrated from here I am feeling male to now I'm not? What, what allows for that confusion, do you think? Well, we have done a lot of interviews with various people, including many trans people. Uh, and the conclusion is that gender dysphoria is a mental illness. It's a mental illness. So people have all kinds of mental illnesses. They feel that they shouldn't have an arm. They feel that they shouldn't have this. They feel that they shouldn't have that. They are distressed by various aspects of their body. Some people think... Some people look in the mirror and see someone who's fat while they're, they're really, really thin. We call that anorexia. Um, some people eat food and then go to the bathroom and, and throw it up, right? Uh, that we call that bulimia. And actually, interestingly, many of the people, particularly young women who are now gender dysphoric, are the ones that used to have anorexia and bulimia, statistically speaking, in the past. So they're able to do that on on an individual level because you know human brains have variability that they're not perfect some people uh experience distress some people experience illness we all experience illness of one kind or another at some point um but we don't go well i am diabetic therefore i now identify as healthy right um so it's I, I, and I don't say this in any unkind way. I have a lot of empathy for people who suffer from these conditions. I really, truly do. We have someone that works at trigonometry uh, who is, a, we had her on recently. I don't know if you caught that episode, mm -hmm. an employee of ours. And that's what she says. It's, it's a disorder. It's a mental disorder um, that people need help with. The problem is in our society today, we have created the idea that you can identify out of reality. Uh, and all you have to do is re replace the, wo the word identity with pretend to be or claim to be or whatever, and everything suddenly makes sense. There are some men who pretend to be women, or there are some men who feel that they are women, or who claim to be women, and they're allowed to feel that they're women. Not, that's, that's their right. You can dress whatever way you want. If you turn up here in a dress, that's your right. L let's not say pretend. Let's feel that, right? Some people feel that they are the opposite sex. I may feel that I'm a six foot four NBA player. I'm not. And indulging that delusion of mine isn't kindness. It's not virtuous. It's not right. It doesn't help me. It doesn't help anyone. Now, if people want to identif identify any which way and they're not hurting anybody, that's absolutely fine. But indulging their feelings, pretending that we agree with them when we don't, is not helping anyone. The way that you feel good about yourself is basically following the guidelines of fulfillment, which I think there's a recipe for. And okay. it goes something like this. The, again, evolution guy over here. So you evolution is going to guarantee that if you do the following things, you will be fulfilled. And if you don't, you won't, no matter what, don't care how rich you are. You're going to have to work really hard mm -hmm. to gain a set of skills mm -hmm. that allow you to serve yourself and others in a way that you find exciting. Mm. If you do that, your life will be awesome. If it comes easily to you, you won't have the things you want. If you work really hard, but only serve yourself, you won't have the things you want. Like there, nature is trying to make sure that you have kids that stay alive long enough to have kids that have kids. So it's like, that. that's the drill. And that is as far as I can tell, that's the formula that's gonna make you feel that way. So in the working hard and all that is where you earn your own respect, Earning your own respect is about having a value system. You say, these are the things that are worthy of respect and I'm going to do these. Uh, I think the only feedback loop is the pursuit of fulfillment. So anyway, if you're doing things to earn your own respect, 
then I think you'll feel good about yourself when you're by yourself. Even if you're failing, there's a whole, I've got a whole shtick about how to construct your mindset mm -hmm. to be resilient, et cetera, et cetera, it's beyond what we're talking about right now. Where does raising children, particularly if you're a woman, fit into that? Okay, so... And family generally. So this is where you, if you think about all, like what I'm trying to do is the grand scale version of what having a family is. Mm. And I think if the, um, if the individual is the right level of analysis for your own life, for the government to think about the its constituency, all of that is, is to get down to the individual. The family is the smallest cluster of meaning. Mm. And so you get, if nature wants to make sure that you contribute to the group, the family becomes the place where you can first express that, but it's also the place where you get to be, uh, you have a role. And so you're going to be able to have autonomy. Mm. So there's, um, a lot of things, if you've read Steven Pinker's book, Drive, uh, talks a lot about this. Daniel Pink? I forget which one of them wrote this, forgive me. Uh, but there's a book called I don't Drive. Think it's Steven Pinker. There's a book called Drive. You're right, it's definitely not. Daniel yeah. Pink, mm. maybe. The book is Drive, anyway. Uh, and in it, it talks about what really drives people. A huge driver, other than meaning and purpose, is autonomy. And so at the family level, there's a reason that people say, I'm the king of the castle, meaning of my own home. Like when I come in my own home, nobody else gets to tell me what to do, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so the husband and the wife come together as this yin yang uh, duel that together is truly better than either of them are individually. Mm. If you take a long-term stance, you're going to shape each other. So you're literally making each other better 100%. when it's functioning well. And then when you have kids, now you've got that. I have done the thing. I have worked hard to become a worthy wife or a worthy husband, a worthy mom, a worthy father. So worked hard, gained a set of skills, and now I'm serving the group, not just myself. So I'm doing things that matter to me. So I'm going to teach my son to be a man in a way that feels good. And I, this is the way I believe things ought to be. Mm. And so in doing that in that small atom, now it's like you're going to get all that fulfillment that you want. Now I get it. This is probably somewhat of a modern construct, even if you give me modern in the last 20,000 years, right? Mm. But I think it's all an echo of things that work at the tribal level, things that work at like the state level, all of it is you get these... The individual has to be strong under themselves, accomplished, that's probably a dangerous word to use, but strong and accomplished in the ways that they will need to be to serve the family, mm. need to be to serve their local community, and then it just scales up from there. So we do have that drive to, um, we're really gonna derail now, but mm. to we want to be recognized for our contributions. Mm -hmm. And so my wife and I do that for each other. Um, we want to have something that lasts beyond us, kids. So anyway, again, I would like to restate, I don't have children. So mm -hmm. it's not the path that I've chosen to walk. But when I look at from an evolutionary standpoint, I'm like, that is the safer path. So anyway, it goes back to there's no solution. There's only trade-offs. Mm. And I just want people to understand, okay, whatever path I walk, it's going to be a trade-off. So what am I trading off? That's right. And I think that's the question that, that's why I said what I said on Twitter about women not having true choice. I didn't quite phrase it that way, but that's what I meant, which is a lot of people are being culturally manipulated into making decisions that are not in their long-term benefit or interest mm. or happiness. They, they, they're just not. They're just not. Um, and they're being encouraged to see uh, the pursuit of meaningless things as far superior to the things that will actually give them meaning and fulfillment on average. Doesn't mean there aren't exceptions, mm. right? But on average. So that I think is, and those things, you know, find a partner who loves you that you love that you grow together with. Uh, have children if that's what you want to do. Uh, seek meaningful work and, um, you know, to me, I'm speaking just from personal experience, personal growth and experience, uh, experiencing myself develop is probably one of the highest values that I hold for myself, you know. Guaranteed. Um, skill acquisition, you know, I always I always talk to my guys about this. It's like, you don't really wanna learn how to do a job necessarily. You wanna acquire a set of skills mm. and build the set of skills that can be used to do many different jobs. Uh, and you package them together. This is why, you know, like, I know you, you, you tried your hand at stand-up and I did stand-up for probably four or five years 
Uh, I never got to the point, you know, it takes about 10 years to become a great stand-up. I never got to the point where I was great. I was doing well. I was pretty good. But what happened was I found something that combined my skills in a better way, which is thinking and talking and joking. And you put that in a package and then you've got something that's much more interesting than just for me, at least as a mm. stand up comedian. I never found that as fulfilling as what I do now. Um, so meaningful work, learn, grow, etc. Uh, and then I think, you know, another layer to add on top of this, and this is actually something that uh, I am aware of, thanks to my wife, men and women are incredibly different, mm. incredibly different. And so you, you can't imagine how surprised I was to find that become <laughs> controversial. I was like, what? <laughs> of all the things, I was like, wait, 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 what? I, I don't know what to say about that, man. I mean, it's so silly that we even have to have this conversation. But mm. men and women are incredibly different. And one of the most beneficial things to my wife and I's relationship has been the fact that we've read books about how exactly different we are. I mean, mm. John Gray, who I think lives somewhere around here, who's been writing about this for decades now. Uh, I don't know if I subscribe to every tenet of his ideology or whatever, but his books work. Uh, and some of the things that I've learned from that meant that we have a much more fulfilled and happy relationship, but mm. also we're much more fulfilled and happy as individuals. Um, so that, that under, you know, it's that know thyself thing, I think. Uh, and part of the, th the problem with what I see is we're deliberately brainwashing people not to realize that they are to a large extent, what they are. Mm. That part of who you are is driven by your biology. And if you can understand how best to manage that, particularly in partnership with someone of the opposite sex, if you are heterosexual, you're gonna, you're gonna be like a rocket that's taking off because you've got all of those things. You know your trigger points, you know the things that, that don't work for you, you know what works for you. Just like, you know, the, I don't know if you're familiar with John Gray's work, but like the idea of the cave for a man. Mm. Mm -mm. Uh, basically, it's the idea that every now and again, a man will pull back in a relationship and will feel like he'll go and like, you know, work, try and repair his motorcycle or play mm. computer games or read a book. And he'll close the door to the office and not be available. And women tend to find that very scary because they're like, whoa, what the hell is going on? Mm. But the guy is just doing his recharge so that he can come back and be full of love again. Like that was revolutionary. Because what women will do if they don't know that is chase after you into the cave, which means you only run away further. And, and right. Right? it's yeah, this yeah. dynamic. And John Gray uh, wrote about this in Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus like 40 years ago. Mm. And now we've got all these crazy people running around saying, oh, there's no difference between men and women. I mean, it's insane. The one that helped me the most, it's like one of those catchy phrases. And I'm like, oh my God, this is so true. Uh -huh. Is uh, women need to feel loved to have sex. Yes. And men need to have sex to feel loved. That's right. When I heard that, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like it was, it was like such an epiphany where, oh, now I get why she acts the way that she does. And now I actually understand myself better because I never really thought about it. But I was like, yeah, if we're not having sex, I feel disconnected. Yes. Whereas for her, if she feels disconnected, she doesn't want to have sex. So now you can get into this really weird dynamic where it's like she wants, you know, all this talk and like connection. And I'm like, man, like I'm not into that unless we're having sex. Like what are we, what are we yeah, even talking about here? Doing. And here again, we come back to the problems with the society that we live in. If you've got that issue going on, which every couple has had, the solution is difficult to articulate out loud because it's very controversial, mm. potentially. I mean, John Gray's solution, I don't want to misrepresent it, but it's kind of like sometimes you need to have sex even though you're not entirely... Do you see what... Oh, I'm waiting for you to say it. Oh, and, and, and it's like, <laughs> do you see what I mean? Oh, now, I do. I am not advocating that anyone has sex that, that for fuck's sake, I don't want to do this, but you know what I mean? I know exactly what you're saying. So in order for men and women to be healthy together, it requires us to be able to say some things that we don't want to say in public. Yeah. And that's a bad place to be that we, we feel hesitant to say them in public. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's a bad place to be if we want, men and women to to be healthier. And that's another th of the things that really bugs me about th the situation that we're in is like the idea that men and women are engaged in some sort of battle of the sexes yeah. is the craziest idea I've ever fucking heard. These two groups of people who have spent the entirety of human evolution having to work together to survive and to thrive. They are 
they're what they're against each other are you crazy mm. are you insane that and and the, the very notion that we spend almost no time talking about how the sexes can and should live together and coexist and grow together and so on and we spend all our time talking about who gets paid more and all of this stuff i'm not saying those things aren't necessarily important and i'm against discrimination of any kind obviously but the focus of our attention to me is on that issue completely in the wrong place mm. yeah it's interesting all of this stuff going back to that idea there there is a reason that these arguments endure and the reason is that there's truth on both sides yes. so uh, I read a lot about history. This is something that came to me pretty recently, like the last five or six years. And you read historical stuff and you realize men and women were working together to survive. It was very harsh, but also like people weren't really trying to understand each other as deeply as we might care about mm. that now. And so there very much was like you went off to war and you did your thing and you really may do some raping and pillaging and then you come back, but it's like, you're still my husband. And so the, all of the stuff of we would never have survived without helping each other. And oh, by the way, people really did rape and pillage. It's like, both of those things are true mm. and history is messy. And one thing I want to talk about today, but maybe not yet, uh, is what I call the triangle of evil. Um, humans are complicated, mm. like really complicated. And if we, I like the idea that there are certain mind viruses that as, as a society make us on the long arc of history bend towards justice. I love that. Like, mm. that's amazing. But any one lifetime can, can have its like horrible things happened in that society, mm. things that we would never be okay with today. I mean, just like really grueling. But at the same time, you can go back to any time in history and there would be love and you'd be, even if you were an arranged marriage that you would find this mutual respect and you'd raise kids that you love and you'd die for each other. I mean, it's just like humans are messy and complicated and beautiful and wonderful. And it's really, really interesting. But you have to be willing to get into the nuance. And so when I think about you know, living in a modern time, I've been with my wife for 22 years mm. and in no uncertain terms, I am a better person because of her. Mm -hmm. I don't know who I would be without her. Mm -hmm. There was a time before she stepped out front. So she was a housewife and just really supporting me. But I was starting to take off as an entrepreneur, starting to get recognized, had a show, like all of that. And... I burst into tears one day and I'm not a crier, man. So for people like that really, really know me, they know that this is like weird. Mm. Uh, I burst into tears one day privately just with my wife. And I was like, you will never get credit for the fact that, of who I've become mm. because you have influenced me. And even, even having that conversation, like I love talking about, there's a reason the cliche of behind every powerful man is a powerful mm. woman because women for eons, not necessarily true now with the pill and the sexual revolution and all that and they're in the workforce, but for millennia, they had to work through men. Mm. And so they got very good at, I want a thing and I'm gonna get you to also want that thing. Are you saying women are manipulative? Oh brother, I'm saying like, <laughs> if, if we can use a word that is less radioactive, but a hundred percent. So uh, in in the movie, Sorry, I'm just no, trolling. I love it. It's just true, it's true. So going back to this idea of being a predictive engine, right? if, if the more you can predict the outcome of your behaviors, right. the closer you're getting to ground truth. Right. And so from an evolutionary perspective, and, and look, this has changed now and it's awesome. Like I want women to work. My wife is, is a boss bitch and, uh, is an entrepreneur in her own right and is unbelievable. But my wife will be the first to tell you, oh yeah, for the first decade of our marriage, she wasn't expressing herself in business. She was expressing herself through me in mm -hmm. business. And it worked and she knew how to get what she wanted. And it was women from an evolutionary perspective, they needed to be optimized to tend to young. And so they have effectively superpowers for raising kids doesn't mean they need to raise kids you can allocate those superpowers however you want mm. but that nature was just like hey i need you to be very good at raising children 15 percent of women have a fourth photoreceptor uh, that actually lets them see colors that guys can't even see which hypothesis goes would help them see changes in color and their skin their kids skin tones so that mm. they'd be able to read sickness mood whatever 
Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Mm. Their breasts can produce milk. I mean, just all kinds of things. Their hips for childbirth, on and on and on. Uh, and so understanding that for millennia, women were, I mean, we are a sexually dimorphic species, not massively. We're not like gorillas where they're, you know, eight times bigger than the female, but there is sexual dimorphism. Men have stronger upper bodies, et cetera, et cetera. So the workloads would tend to get broken up in a certain way. And so if you're not going to be the half of the species that's going to confront something head on, like for a woman, and unfortunately I've seen uh, these YouTube videos where when you see a guy snap and get uh, throw a punch on a woman and you recognize the difference in ability to generate force, mm. it's distressing. And you realize at the ends of the spectrum, because there's a ton of overlaps, so of course, there's a lot of women that could beat up a lot of men. But as you get to the ends of the distribution, the strongest man is going to be able to beat up every single woman on the planet, mm. period, bar none, end of story. Uh, and so it would not be a good evolutionary strategy for women to do the confrontation head on. So they get far more um, ingenious. Like they just have a sophisticated set of tools that happen to be psychological in nature. That was a lot of words to get around the word manipulation, but you get the idea. So um, I was rocked to tears to be like, whoa, you've shaped me into a person mm. that you will never get credit for. Thankfully now with everything that's happened, I think she does get a lot of credit and she's able to tell her own story and all of that. Um, but it was really a breathtaking moment for me to realize, whoa, like you have shaped me. I have shaped you. We are a partnership. We bring equal value, but in different ways. And the more we've come to understand the different things that we're good at, and each of us are good at different things, but together we really do bring equal weight, but they're not the same thing. Like no. we're not competing on the same things. Uh, you know what? It's so interesting to me that you told that story because uh, my wife and I are exactly the same. I've uh, been together 20 years. Mm. Um, I know you guys have been together so long. Yeah, I've uh, been together that long, and it, it was exactly the same story. Uh, my wife was uh, always working uh, from the beginning, but she was also working on me from the beginning, mm. and pretty damn hard, actually. Um, and I actually, I forgot to give you a copy of my book. I'll give you one afterwards. But, oh, I have read it. Uh, I, I know, well, but I want to give you a signed copy, and if I'll you've read that. it, you know that... The dedication in it says to Alina, with whom not, without whom nothing would be possible mm. and everything would be pointless. And that's how I feel. Um, and more generally, you know, uh, women are incredible. The, to a man, a woman is fucking amazing mm. because she can do things that you... Like, I remember the first time uh, I saw my mom resolve a conflict just with a smile and a joke. I was like, wow. I couldn't believe it. Because it was so different to the way that young men in particular mm. tend to do things. And I was like, whoa, this is incredible. And so that's one of the terrible things about the standoffs that we create. It's like you can learn so much and grow so much together and help each other so much mm. um, that you know this division is completely unnecessary. It should be the other way around. We should be looking for ways to work together and... Um, you know, that's why I've always found uh, personal development and relationship growth together to be like essential parts of life, mm. essential parts of life. So I hear exactly what you're saying. Now, as for the recognition, I mean, do you, do you, you know, I believe that partly by talking about it, my wife does get the credit by mm. dedicating my book to her in that way. She, from people who read the book, she gets the credit. And also now I'd like to think after all the hard work that she put in, the investment is starting to slowly pay off. Mm. And as we know from Jordan Peterson, women make 80% of the purchasing decisions. So uh, all that bacon that I'm uh, going to be bringing home, you know, she's going to be enjoying the fruits of that. And so are our children. And that's kind of how it should be, at least for us. You know, um, she she's very talented photographer in her own right, but it's not something that she's ever made into a huge business. Uh, and I'm sure she'll carry on doing it. But right now she just wants to be with our son. And mm. I, I, I could not be happier to be able to provide that in a society in which that's actually become quite difficult. Mm. Not many people can do that for each other. Very true. 
Yeah, it's interesting. And society definitely has a lot of influence on what people want or think they're supposed to Mm -hmm. want. So I lived a really interesting trajectory with my wife. So started out, she was a good Greek girl, raised to be a housewife. Her dad literally said, all right, fine, you want to go study film? It doesn't matter. You're just going to end up married and with kids. And he didn't mean it in a horrible way. I mean, that's just how he came up. Mm -hmm. And so for her, she was very much raised to be a wife and a mother. But she had dreams. And, but for the first decade of our relationship, she wasn't pursuing it. She ended up writing a book about this. And it was actually really interesting to see the beginning of our marriage from her perspective mm. of like, oh, I've kind of been relegated to this housewife role. I don't know. Like, I know I want to be a mom because in the beginning she did. She wanted four kids. And, uh, you know, I know I want to be a mom, but I don't know that I want to be a housewife. And so, but I do want to support my husband. And so like, that was the vibe. And then I needed her help at work when we started this new company. And she was like, to support my husband, Mm. I will help. No interest in being an entrepreneur, just I want to be a good wife. I'm going to support my husband. And then supporting me was like, okay, the job's getting kind of big. Okay, now you, I'm going to need you to hire some employees. Now you're running a division with 40 people under you and you're responsible for $85 million in revenue and you've got like a 10,000 square foot warehouse and like all this stuff. And it was just like, whoa, how did I turn around? And and she's now an entrepreneur and like in the thick of it for years. And then realizes actually, I don't want kids. I'm getting so much fulfillment out of this and growing and all of that, that I want to do this thing. And I had to mourn the loss of my housewife. Mm. And it's something that we've talked really openly about. And she, you know, as this is all playing out, becoming very different, the dynamic between us is changing. And I was like, I want you to become whoever you want to become. Hmm. And my value system mandates that I help you thrive in whatever way you want to thrive. But you have to give me the space to mourn that I used to have somebody that was supporting me cooking all my meals, laying out my clothes, taking care of the house. Um, you know, we were preparing to have kids, all that. And and now that's going mm-hmm. away. Mm-hmm. And I'm cool with that because I want you to be who you want to be. But let's be realistic about this is a major change. And so this is going to take some reorientation. Mm-hmm. And so we talk through it and process through it. And I actually was very fine not having kids. For the longest time, I was the one dragging her feet. She wanted to have kids right away. And I was like, yo, let's slow roll this here. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I was very fine with that. But that change in dynamic wasn't something that was easy. But to your earliest point on this, it's we're not battling. Like we're trying to find this thing where we're sharing a life together. And that's how we've always looked at it is, okay, for us, divorce isn't an option. We never say the D Mm -hmm. word. We don't even joke about it. So I'm never going to be like, oh, if you don't do that, mm-hmm. you're going to find yourself out on the street. Ha, ha, ha. Mm-hmm. Like, nope, we don't yeah. play that game at yeah. all. Yeah, we don't either. And um, this is the other thing that's difficult to say. But if you want to preserve a relationship, that's the sort of attitude that we will take in a lot of cases. In a lot of cases. And there are people who get married and never never say a crossword to each other. Mm. Uh, but they're not the majority. Um and there are obviously people who are abusive and, and all of that. But for the vast majority of people, having a relationship that you're not prepared to give up on, either of you, it has to be both of you. Mm. It has to be both of you that are not prepared to give up on, uh, is going to make it much more likely that you don't give up on it. Absolute facts. And so, again, in a culture where we treat each other much more as objects than we, I think, ever have done before mm. where you know oh blonde brunette you know get whatever you want on on an app uh, that is much less likely i think and also we are all um we're all so much more interested in ourselves as individuals um that 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 again becomes more difficult so um that thing that you're talking about that's the way that's the way it's certainly the way that i've experienced it um, the way to fulfillment in a relationship, the way to being together, to being able to have different visions of your future and reconcile them over time and accept that you're not both exactly the way that the other person would like. Mm. That's a that's a process, man. That's a process. 
that you have to really, really work on. Uh, and in order to do that, when you've got all these other great options, supposedly, um, you know, it takes that commitment. It takes that commitment, I think. It takes saying, we're not talking about divorce. Mm. Because there's, I don't know about you, there have been plenty of situations in which in our relationship, we could have gone down that, towards that path at least, mm. you know? Um, and to me, you know, all the stuff that we do and whatever, it's inevitable that your relationship with your spouse is going to be the most important thing. Uh, it just is. No doubt. Just is. No doubt. Yeah, man. Relationships, this is, it's hard to watch what's happening in the culture now where they're just people having sex a lot less and you get the, um, God, I always forget how the stat goes, but it's like a small number of men are getting um, all the action, getting all the action. Yeah. Right. Nice, nice and easy way to say it. And then hypergamy, which for people that haven't heard that word before, the female tendency to date across and up yep. in the status hierarchy. Um, as women make more money, it becomes a more narrow pool. Mm -hmm. And if they're not able to broaden their horizons economically, then they find themselves without a mate or they're competing for that really, really small pool of guys that then aren't, uh, they're not gonna commit because they've got so many women coming to them for sex. And I hear this anecdotally. I mean, I, I have friends who are like incredible women. Incredible. They're hot. They are successful. They are f fucking brilliant, talented. And, and they they find themselves in relationships with guys where, you know, th their expectation of what relationship is supposed to be, which is commitment and so on. Mm. Because the, the guy that they're with has to be even, in many situations, even more richer, amazing, even more yeah. amazing. You don't need to, you don't need to commit. It doesn't need to commit. And and there's also another factor here, which is, you know, again, this is difficult to say, but uh, mate value is different for men and women, particularly over time. Yeah. And as a woman, as you get older, a, a guy in his 50s who's a, a billionaire and successful and famous and whatever, he doesn't need to be dating a woman his age. Mm. Right, but a woman in her 50s is not likely to be dating a hot 25-year-old guy. It's just right. not how that works. So I feel really so much empathy and sympathy and a lot of concern, actually, for women who are in that situation because mm -hmm. they deserve to, to, to be fulfilled and to have those relationships and to have the kids that they want to have. But we've, we've got a society where that that's more difficult mm. you know it, it's it's really not a healthy situation in my opinion and also you talk about you know um people having less sex and it's true young people are having less sex than others and you do have the the issue at the top of the sort of ma male where they're having a lot but also there are a lot of women now who are having a lot of sex not because they actually want to but because they think that this is the one that's going to take them to the relationship mm. that they want you see what i mean and women are now quite often finding themselves having sex in a very masculine male way, mm. where it's like you're supposed to not feel detachment, not feel attachment, and all of that. And the truth is, that's not really how it works for the vast majority of women. There are some exceptions, of course, but having sex in a male way for women just kind of makes them miserable, mm. you know. And I, I think that's tragic. I think we should all acknowledge that that's tragic. That that the, a lot of women are doing things that aren't making them happy, but again, for some reason, saying it makes you a bad person. Mm. I think that so. If I were going to steal, man, why that makes you a bad person? Here's yeah. what I think is happening. Yeah. So there is people need to know that I'm a worthy person. I'm worthy of love. Mm -hmm. I'm worthy of respect no matter what path I choose. And so that's why, if I were going to insert like a new way to talk about this, it's yeah. like. It, let's say that I'm a life counselor and mm. I, I do this in business a lot. Mm. I, I actually, I do this in life uh, stuff. We have something called Impact Theory University. People come and ask me questions and I'm like, here's how I think through that problem. Mm -hmm. If somebody came to me with that, the first thing I always say is, okay, what's your goal? You tell me the goal and then I'm gonna try to help you get there. Mm. Uh, and if you tell me that, okay, my goal is to have a lot of sex, but I don't wanna catch feels. Okay, we can do that. But we have to understand there's no solutions, only trade-offs. So if you run that, here are going to be the potential risks given what evolution has primed you for 
which is going to be connection that uh, sex is a high investment thing because from an evolutionary standpoint, you getting pregnant was a big deal for guys, not so much. Mm -hmm. Amazing, you know, dine and dash and they're good and maybe they have a kid, maybe they don't. But for you, you're going to carry that kid. It's a huge expense. You have to raise them. Ah, So that is a, it puts you in a super vulnerable position, all that. So there's a lot of machinery in your brain that's going to be different than the mm -hmm. partner that you're seeking who's really wired for that game that you're playing. Mm -hmm. So we can do it, cool, but like we need to understand what what are going to be the trade-offs here. Odds of you catching feels go up a lot. Odds of you finding fulfillment in doing that go down a mm -hmm. lot. Uh, you're going to be pulling against sort of the evolutionary trajectory, which again, I'm perfectly open to navigating that path. But I just want people to start. This, this isn't a moral thing. You're not a worse person. Yeah. But if you're playing a, what I'll, when I say a higher risk game, what I mean is that evolution has given you a playbook for fulfillment. There's not only one path. So there are different ways to get there. But like the thing that I think protects Lisa and I somewhat is we understand by not having kids that we're, we're taking the more high risk hmm. path to fulfillment because we're doing it through a company. That's part of it. So what happens to my fulfillment if the, the public that is consuming the product that I make is like, this sucks. Hmm. Do I get to be fulfilled anymore? Or is it now, well, you didn't get the outcome that you wanted, and so that invalidates my whole life? Mm. So I've, we've had to build like thought matrices to deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. So the way that we combat that is don't value yourself for the end result, value yourself for the sincere pursuit. Mm -hmm. So did you sincerely try to get a growth mindset out at scale through ideas and entertainment? Yes, but it just, it didn't work. I was never able to quite build the skill set. All right, man, you went for something. You really played to mm -hmm. win and et cetera, et cetera. So, all right, you're, you're going down this, this high risk path, not, not risk, you know, necessarily cosmically, just fulfillment mm -hmm. is my North Star. I laid that out earlier, what I think everybody should be optimizing for. And so if we can strip some of the judgment away from that, if we can give people a growth mindset so they know, oh, I didn't get what I wanted. Okay, I can try something different and hopefully get something more akin to what I want in another path. So you're not giving up your agency. You know what you want. You established your goal first. You run an experiment. This, this is literally the physics of progress. Mm. You know what your goal is. You see what the obstacle is between where you're at and your goal. You run the experiment. Did you actually get closer to your goal? Yes, no. Mm. If no, try again better the next time. You know what I mean? You just repeat the cycle. But if you feel like, whoa, I didn't get what I wanted. That doesn't feel good. I feel judged by you. Now I'm just going to go on the attack so you don't tell me the thing that I'm feeling. Mm. And that's where it's like, well, now you can't even navigate well on the higher risk path that you've chosen to get the fulfillment that you ultimately want to feel. Which is where we come back to the fact that most people are not operating at a level of emotional detachment that you are. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, and also if you speak to women privately, a lot of them will say that the, the, the falling into the trap that I described is not a deliberate thing. They're not going out to go and have lots of sex without catching the feels. If they're actually honest with themselves, not all of them, but many of them, uh, if they can get past the emotion, what they what they actually want is to 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 date and find a partner to be with for the for, you know, I was going to say the rest of the life because that's kind of my value, but you know what I mean mm. to to settle down with to have children with whatever if the, if that's what they want, um, but they're not able to do that because they feel that there's a pressure because all the other girls are available to the guy that they're currently mm. with to have sex with on the second day. Mm. However, anecdotally, as I observe people around me, the women who don't don't let that happen straight away tend to end up much more likely securing the partner. Yeah. That, that seems to be a, a strategy that works better. Um, but you're right. I mean, I, I'm actually loving this conversation so much, partly because you are showing people a way of operating in the world that is so much more powerful than the way that the vast majority of people operate. Probably mm. to some extent, me included. I don't have the level of emotional detachment that you do uh, in terms of making these decisions. So it's, uh, I'm learning. To learn more about these complex topics, check out this episode with the one and only Jordan Peterson. Man, I am beside myself with excitement to have you on.